What's up? This is Silas back again for the Dishing on Dish series. That's the last part of his five part one, which is a subsection in the You Are What We Consume series. <laughs> My friend Stephen, Stephen, say hello to the people and tell them a little bit about what we're talking about today. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're well. Today, we're going to be wrapping up our discussion on seasonal restaurant and vine bar. This section will see, will feature solely desserts. In the previous sections, of course, we did amuse-bouche, appetizer, entree, and one dessert. Today, we're going to be finishing the rest of the desserts. I actually had a hand in preparing some of these, so I think it's very interesting, even though I'm not a pastry chef by trade. But they were, well, the way it works, and we'll get into this as the discussion goes on, but uh, a lot of the components were prepped elsewhere by a pastry chef, and I mostly assembled them. But it, it was it was a good experience, and I got to learn more about desserts in general, especially some of these Austrian desserts, which, again, are part of my heritage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So with this series of Dish and Dish, we talk about specifically foods. Like uh, Stephen has been kind enough to actually go and gorge himself with some delicious food all over the place and take photographs. And then he comes and gives us details about it. He's had a background in the food service industry. And you can check out this other series that we have that will be posting more about that. So I know great people where he goes into a lot of deep detail about his history in the food service industry, both in the front of house and in the back of house. So full, full aspect on that. Then Aside from that, it's something that he's really looked into and really cares a lot about. So he has a lot of insight about the food. And as he mentioned with this specific restaurant, it's the second restaurant that he worked at. And he was in the behind the he was in the back of the house in this one. And did you work any front of the house in this at all? Or this is entirely back of the house. No, it's actually interesting you should ask though, because at one point I was actually considering working in front of the house because the place was slowing down a lot. And uh, I was thinking like, should I change jobs for money? And I thought about doing front of the house because I, I thought, well, it'll pay a little better and I can sort of stay in the orbit. And then if I want to go back to the kitchen, I can. But but this was during a slow time. So mm -hmm. my boss basically said, he's like, sorry, I don't really have front of the house stuff available either. Like I can give you like, you know, a day or two a week, but like you can't live off that. So oh. how many people start front of the house and then go back versus I, I imagine a lot more start back of the house and then go front. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting you should say that because I know I know some people in kitchens who worked as servers and didn't like it, but that's probably a handful of people. Usually the the other is more common. I mean, like what I did do, doing kitchens and deciding it's not for them going to front house. So that's more common, at least in my experience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So with this restaurant, he's given us a lot of information. Some of the dishes, he's actually been like, okay, I actually added this to it, and he's given us a lot more insight into what the chefs and the people running the restaurant were thinking about with the meals that they actually made. And as he mentioned with this one, the people who ran this place, unfortunately, is in the past. This restaurant that no longer exists. They also ran uh, the um, catering out to the German embassy. And mm -hmm. we were talking about the whole like in-house is something I have a pet peeve about when people say like home cooking. I'm like, it's not, it's not a home. It's not a house. <laughs> it's a mm -hmm. home. <laughs> but then it's like the in-house type of thing, which is a specific term for it actually being made on location versus being ordered from outside. But with this situation, they ran a bigger kitchen in the German embassy. Mm -hmm. And to me, that still counts as in-house because it's still your kitchen. It's still the kitchen by the people running. It's just like a bigger place. He's shown us some pictures of this. It was a rather slimmer, thinner type of area. So the kitchen itself wasn't that massive. But if you have all these other different places, it works. Like when we were talking about DB Bistro, we talked about how he has DB Bistro. Daniel Balud had DB Bistro. And what was the other place that he had? Uh, well, so there was Cafe, there was Danielle, Cafe Balud, DB Bistro, Bar Balud. Um, there was there was DBGB, but that's closed. And then there's a few places throughout the world, like there's DB Bistro in Miami. Uh, he has something in Singapore. There's a Bar Balud London. There's a Bar Balud Boston. So he has yeah. a few others. I mostly just focus on the New York because it's relevant to the yeah. discussion. But yeah. in the New York ones, it would be the, one of the biggest kitchen would probably create some things that would be shipped out. Maybe some sauces or some base base parts of the sauces or some cuttings for certain things would probably be shipped out to several other places. And I can't really consider that to be like not in house because that's that's stuff that's still by the same kind of people on the same kind of management over the same kind of orders. So it's in that estimation, I don't really consider that to be to be out of it. So with this dish on dish talks about this, and it's a subsection for the you are what you consume series, which is a series about just different things, food, the things we consume, the fats, the cal the carbohydrates, and the proteins that build up our bodies. And then everything else around there with the ideas and the thoughts that come up to how we get those fats and the carbohydrates and, 
and proteins to build up our bodies, why certain cultures organize in their certain ways, how certain foods have changed the way certain cultures behave, or how, how certain cultures have actually altered and changed the foods that they intake. And it's something that we all we all eat. If you're, if you're listening to this, you've eaten before. If you could understand this, you've eaten something in your life. So it's just an interesting series for me, and I really enjoy having these conversations. Um, anything else you want to say about the series itself? Well, just just to add on to your point, and when I worked at Barbalu, the bread actually was made at Danielle that we used for Croque Monsieur's. So that was a similar story because they have a much bigger staff. I think I had mentioned in a previous discussion, their prep uh, kitchen has like 60 cooks in it or something, and then their line is like 18 people. So the thing is, when you have a facility that big, that allows you to do a lot of that stuff. So you can make all this bread and you can send it to different places. Yeah. Charcuterie used to be made in-house at Barbalu, but then but all these other restaurants in his group started serving charcuterie. So they had to actually set up a separate facility where they just made charcuterie and shipped it out because it was such a project. You know, you need all the space. You have to break down whole animals, all this. It's too much in one kitchen. You actually need a facility. And then you just have to send out everything to the restaurants from there. Some people may not know that. And some people may take issue with that. But again, it's like, if you understand the, if you understand the logistics of how a restaurant operates, it's like, you can't make every single thing from scratch right there all the time. I mean, it's just, it's like, you know, if you can open a restaurant and do that, I'll, I'll be impressed, but it's not realistic generally. <laughs> yeah. And that is, for me, one of the reasons I really like this talk and just having conversations with Stephen and other people. In, ter in essentially this channel, this content that I think Stephen and I are both interested in creating is just about information, just info, how like source. Some of the content that we take in is just, we're, we're the type of people that will go online and like, listen to people speak for three hours long, as long as it's like yeah. new information or content or just information that's coming in, data, I'm an infoholic. So with this series, it's kind of like that some of them are long. This is the fifth part of this particular series. We've talked about at least five other restaurants, and most of those are multi-parts. But if you listen to this, you can check somewhere on there. There'll be like a content where you can go jump around to the different dishes that we have. You can listen to it two times speed, one times speed, seven, three times speed on certain platforms, certain things, depending where you listen. I think only Audible so far can go up to like 3.5 speed, but it's not Audible yet. But anyway, so you can take your time. You can come back and listen to other dishes. But we just like talking about this. We try to limit this series, at least this series, to about an hour and a half. But we've had other series talking about other things where I think the longest video we posted was about single video was about three and a half hours. But We've yeah. had ones where we talked for longer and then you did, I decided to let me cut those out <laughs> like two hours. <laughs> but, but I think we, with this series, I've been enjoying it so far. We have a few things. Can you give us a bit of a, of we talked about this a bit ahead of time. This gives a bit of a spoiler before or just a, a preview of some of the things coming up down the line because this is the last part of this series before we actually get into the talking of the food here. Sure. So next video we'll probably be doing is Gabriel Kreuther. That was a place I ate the other day with my friend or our friend, Andrea. Um, it was my first experience at a two Michelin star restaurant. Got some really good photos and videos. An excellent experience. Most money I've spent in a little bit, but it was definitely worth it. Probably probably go back in the future. Not, you know, not go all the time, but, you know, maybe like once every few months or something. Uh, but, you know, a lot of good content there. Again, photos, videos. Uh, we're, we're probably also going to do videos on the last two places I worked. The last one was Felidia. Before that, it was Netta. So that's it, I mean, we would say Italian restaurant. They would say, no, it features certain regions of Italy, but that would be the last one. And then Netta was Japanese, mostly sushi. Those two places, unfortunately, are closed now. But, um, you know, I do have plenty of photos. Of course, I worked in each one for some time, so I have a lot of good memories as well as information on them. So I thought we could discuss those. And also because we haven't discussed Italian or Japanese food yet, I thought that'd be a good topic. I mean, as you can probably tell by the things I post and things I talk about, I love French food, but it's like, I don't want to just cover French style places. It just, uh -huh. you know, gets kind of boring. <laughs> Okay, so before we get into the actual thing, this series, the way it normally goes, is in the first one, we go into a lot more in-depth about the actual restaurant, so you can check out for more details about that particular one if you want to see the first one in the series. But I'll just do just some quick bullet points, you can answer some quick short answers to the different things we normally like touching about, about the restaurants before we get into the series. <laughs> so one of the first sections I'd like to talk about is the place itself. So where yep. was the location of this when it was open? It was 58th between 6 and 7, so picture the bottom of Central Park. It was like two blocks south of that, I want to say, right near Carnegie Hall. Okay. And how many tables around there was it the size of the place? It was about 70 seats. I think it was like 72, 74, something like that. Um, if I recall, that includes the bar as well. There was a photo of the bar we posted in the first one. 
Mm -hmm. uh, mostly mostly smaller tables. I mean, mostly booths and little cafe style tables. I mean, I think we had six tops too, but I, th I I don't remember any huge parties. Like there were no eight tops or ten tops or anything. Other places I've worked, we've done that for sure. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what was the ambiance? So definitely more on the casual side. Um, you know, we, it's supposed to be modeled off of a Viennese cafe. So the booths, uh, cafe style tables. I, I'd mentioned previously that was one of the criticisms is that to be a tr to get two Michelin stars or more, you have to be real fine dining with white tablecloths. There has to be enough space to clear the tables, all this. This didn't have that. I mean, I personally wasn't bothered by that, but if you want to achieve that higher level, you need that because people are just, it, it's just, it's a certain standard of service. You're supposed to have that much space where they can circle your table and also you can get up and there's nobody um, too close. It, it's sort of been a pet peeve of mine. I remember there was this place, you know, not to go too far off topic, but there was a place we used to go to in Wildwood, New Jersey, where it was like a family style restaurant, but like everybody was so close to each other. And I remember one of my grandparents complaining. They're like, I hate going there because like you're eating and like someone else, someone else's elbow is in your face. And it's like, that's <laughs> how it felt though. Cause all the, all the tables were close together, but it was a popular place. So they would turn and burn these tables, but it's like, you're sitting and there's like someone like right here, there's someone here. And it's just like, I don't know. It, it, it's it's too much after a certain point, and of course, fine dining. You're supposed to have that plenty of space where, like, if I were to like stand up and like swing my arms around, there'd be nobody close to me. It's yeah. just it's just like you're supposed to. It's just it's the luxury of giving you that space, I suppose. Uh, uh. Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and the the next section we used to talk about, we we like talking about in this in the start is uh, just about the the food, the content that's actually like being yeah. in the restaurant. So the menu, as you said, this was uh, what the genre of the menu. This was um, you said Austrian German, right? Yeah. So the the two owners are from Austria. It's it's supposed to be higher end Austrian food, but I always make the point that it wasn't purely Austrian food. If you watch the last one where we went through the entrees, we did have a bunch of authentic dishes like Wiener Schnitzel, Toffel Spitz. There was an authentic German dish, the um, Sauerbraten. So basically, but basically, I think they had agreed that we're just going to feature a few a few ethnic dishes for the sake of authenticity, but everything else is whatever. There's no strict adherence to any particular theme, just for the sake of including those dishes. But it's like, it didn't have to run along those lines. Cause I mean, I, I forget if they said this, but I mean, my stance on that is always something like, if you limit yourself to that cuisine, like in the in the pure form, you're going to limit yourself so much because Austria is a landlocked country. A lot of these ingredients probably didn't even make it into Austria until maybe, you know, last few decades. So it's like, Unless all you want to serve is meat and potatoes type stuff, it's like that's going to get boring very quickly. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things that I think is really exciting to see in this series is you get to really appreciate the 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 work that goes into it, and it makes you appreciate the food more and like the the, the challenges that are being made, and I think it makes you. It makes at least it makes me and I think it makes people more aware of what they're ordering and more calculated. And something I keep repeating is I like going in and seeing like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I like ordering things that will inspire me to make something at home, to use that as part of my cooking skill set, or something that I understand takes a lot of ingredients or is prepared in a certain way that chances are I'm never going to actually try to do that. It's going to be mm. a very low chance of me to do that. So I'd rather somebody else do it. And you go to actually pay like, yes, I love chicken tendies like anybody else. <laughs> like I saw this one meme, it's, it's like it's some, some, uh, some uh, a some female looking cartoon character kind of frowning off to this guy who has got his eyes closed. It's like me listening to the, me listening to the uh, waiter list off the, the specials knowing that I'm just going to order the chicken tendies. It's like, mm. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you can go and get some really good lemon chicken from anywhere, but then if I'm going to go sit down in a restaurant, I'm not going to order lemon chicken. Like, <laughs> there's so many other things that you can order. Lemon yeah. chicken is something you can easily make at home. And now with, with that and the, the menus and things like that, what we like to also talk about was just the general price. Was a fixed price? Was there combos? Uh, Pre-free? No, pre-free. Pre Pre-fix. Pre-fix. Yeah. That's like the f fixed price where you come in and you pay for a certain amount and then there's a certain selection of dishes that you can take. Sometimes, uh, what's the omakase? Is that omakase the thing from the, the, the Japanese, yeah. Japanese restaurants where the actual chef picks for you yeah. at the, a fixed price? But then uh, pre-free is prefix is normally something where you can go and there's different selections. And that's what you had at Gabriel Caruther, right? Probably there, yeah. Um, because... 
Because I was going to say omakase translates roughly in Japanese as I'll leave it up to you. And the idea is that the chef basically picks what he wants. And that was actually, we'll, we'll probably talk about it in the video about Netta, but that was one complaint where the omakase and Netta had stayed the same for a while. And the thing is omakase is supposed to be kind of spontaneous because it's like whatever the chef wants to give to people. And, you, you know, he, he or she takes you through their experience. The idea now, obviously, if you have a dietary restriction or something, they can modify things a little bit. But again, I, I've made the comparison before. Like I said in our discussion with Laura, it's kind of like a Broadway show. Like you don't dictate how the show goes; you let them take you through it. And you know, you, you may you probably won't love everything, but the odds are, if they're a good chef, you'll you'll like the majority. And usually, depending on the person, they'll probably like some things, dislike other things, love a few things. But I mean, that's pretty much how it is. It's like you know, it's it's hard to get a menu where everything is phenomenal across the board. Uh. When you yeah, have that many courses. Think, uh. So, so at this, but Gabriel Carter also had a a a chef's menu where he pe where he picks and chooses, right? Where the, yeah, where there's the, a there's a, there, there's a chef's tasting as well. Um, I think they also do the chef's table uh, in a place Les Bollier where I did my externship used to do that, where you actually sit in the kitchen and they run you a series oh, wow. of dishes. Yeah, and they do that too. But and I I know with that you have to pay a little more money and you get a certain table. The Modern actually, where uh, he used to actually run the Modern. I don't know if you're familiar the restaurant in MoMA. He used to actually run that. They do that there too. I saw the kitchen there. They have a table set up for that. Oh, wow. uh, some people just like seeing the chefs watch when they work. I mean, mafia, for me yeah. that's my. For me, that's my career background, so it doesn't really excite me too much. I mean, it's impressive what it's it's impressive what they can do, but I don't know. I'd rather be in the dining room where it's usually cooler and more pleasant. And then, and I, I found at Les Bollier, the chef's table was kind of annoying because like they would sit by the walk-in, and then if you needed something from the walk-in, you weren't supposed to go over there. But then it's like. I can't not have stuff for service. And then like, I don't know, it just, it seems like it's kind of a disruptive experience. Whereas you sit in the dining room, you have your whole space. And I don't yeah. know, that's just, that's just me personally. I mean, I don't know, maybe some people just love watching chefs work, it's, you know, for them. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And so with, with seasonal, you, you had the, the price range, it was, as you mentioned, it's a Michelin star restaurant. So yeah. it was a bit pricier than usual, but you said they, they were aiming to try to get, to get a little lower price point. And uh, do they have any any fixed price combos type of things like that, or is this you come in and you you order off the menu? Yeah, you could do. Uh, there was a, there was called the seasonal tasting, and there was also the chef's tasting. I'm trying to remember if one was like three courses, the other was five or something. And I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember the price. It was like fifty for one, seventy bucks for another, or something. Which you know, which considering the quality of food is really good. I mean, the portions aren't huge, but it's like when you consider it's Michelin star food, you get a few courses. I mean, that's really good. I mean. Like like Gabriel Kreuther the other day, I got three courses. Andrea got four. But the thing is, we'll we'll you'll we'll do we'll, you'll see when we do the video. But the courses themselves aren't huge, but some of it's rich. And like I feel like for me that was the right amount of food, especially because I've been trying to lose weight lately. So for me, it's like you know someone with a huge appetite would say it's not enough, but it's like. I think it's the right amount of food, and also it's usually rich enough. I mean, you feel full. It's like I don't, I don't feel hungry after leaving these places generally. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now the last part of the content was it's it's called seasonal, so this was easy. Uh, it, it what is the very like the variedness of the actual like the menu? Is it was it a seasonal menu, or some places go go permanent? And I think this is something that, if I'm not mistaken, when you go with the higher Michelin, when you go to Michelin stars and higher restaurants, most of those are. Most of those will have a base amount of things. Maybe twenty-five percent of the things will be will be regular all the time, but then there'll be other things that can, that are completely seasonal. It might be from what I've seen with this series. From what I've seen is they'll have a certain certain arrangement, a certain way of plating certain things, or we want a certain kind of red meat protein, a certain veg to it, or certain things. But then that red meat or the veg will change according to the season. So that's this, another part of this. You can tell us just a bit about if it was a seasoned or permanent uh, a permanent menu of the, of the actual content. Yeah, so uh, you will get into it here, but there's a dessert with strawberries. And I remember running that during the winter and someone made the joke like, oh, are these winter strawberries? <laughs> so it's like, we don't, we don't, we don't directly adhere to it. I mean, in general, you'll see certain themes. Like for example, some of these entrees that featured green things, those were during the spring because all of the spring is big on the green stuff. Summer, you'll see um, certain squash and berries. Fall, you'll see pumpkin squash things like that winter citrus is actually in season in the winter interestingly enough apparently they har harvest pomegranates and so you'll see pomegranate stuff things yeah things like that so but again it's not it's not like the french where the french will be like oh we're only going to use this in season that's it unless it's either pickled preserved canned or you know made to last somehow whereas here we want strawberries in winter we just import them from chile and that's it oh. <laughs> yeah oh. 
Yeah, so that that does that does change. It also always called seasonal. Um, okay, with also the the wine bar part. Yeah. What, what was it with the menu? How how much wine did you have? I think I don't think we've discussed this as as a, no. I mentioned this in the last one. Previously, Stephen has also been having accompaniments with with wines or beers as some of the dishes. Occasionally, we talk about that. In the I Know Great People series, we've also talked to Laura, who does um, natural wines in Canada. We've talked to her, and she might come in and do like a little side section with Stephen where they talk more about the wines or something. But this was called Wine Bar, and we haven't really talked about anything with the wines at the place. How extensive was the wine selection here? It was pretty good. Um, so Wolfgang, his family was actually involved in the wine business. He's from Borgenland. That's the part that borders Hungary. I guess they grow a lot of wine out there as well as in the capital. Well, of course, you know, like like any other country, they have wine in different regions. So I guess he had a heavy hand in um, importing a lot of stuff, pairing. I know when I worked at Eddie and the Wolf, which was their sister restaurant, one of the wine, um, one of the investors was actually a wines importer. So he actually supplied a lot of the wines, mostly Austrian. Um not strictly adhering to that, though. I mean, there was a little like, you know, there's like throwing a French one here, an Italian one here, all that. But like in general, it was geared more towards Austrian and German stuff. So you saw a lot of Rieslings. You saw Sylvaner. You saw Zweigeld. You saw um, I'm trying to think of some other ones off the top of my head. Um, Blau Frankish. That's that's another red wine. Um, you know, typically Germany and Austria is known more for whites. I mean, they do have some decent red ones. I've just you know, I can discuss that more with Laura. Um I'm not as crazy about their reds, like they're not bad, but I would definitely take like a French red over like a, like I would take like a German or Austrian white over a German Austrian red. But then with France, I feel like it's a little more balanced. Like France, like there's some really good red, reds and some really good whites. I mean, that might also be my taste. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I ever told you, but one of my favorite experiences at Eddie and the Wolf was he actually did a Riesling tasting. And um, Carlo, this investor, brought in all these Rieslings and he set them out on all these tables. And the thing is, people tend to think of Riesling as being a sweeter wine, but the thing is, he, he had Rieslings that were like super dry and ones that were cloyingly sweet. Like we talked about the ice wine where it's like, it's almost like syrup, like it's too sweet, but we had stuff that like on those ends and then like everything in between. So it was like, this is a little fruitier, this is a little drier, all this. And it was really just impressive to see like one grape how, you know, in like a relatively small area of the world, how much it can vary. Uh, <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, and what was definitely, I think, if y'all are interested more in wine, I highly suggest, we haven't posted it yet as we're recording this, but depending on when you listen to this, that series will be up already. It was an excellent talk with Laura. We have mm -hmm. a lot of other people lined up for that one. That's a really exciting project I think we're working on that we can yeah, see us it is, yeah. for, for a long time. We, we enjoy talking to each other, so like talking to each other while talking to other people is even an extra bonus. But she, mm -hmm. she goes more into like the wine and the things, and yeah, yeah. it's really interesting stuff. For me, that stuff goes over my head. Even when I was drinking, it was I could tell something, something was kind of low rent, but I can really tell the actual differences between the things and there's actually ways to train your palate to do that always more of a, like hard liquor like gins and and, yeah. and rums and whiskeys and things like that or occasional beers here and there not too much into the wines but yeah a lot of stuff in there so this is a wine bar as well so uh, that's something that's in there uh, but um hmm. i was, so I was gonna also what add happens with all that wine does it now just goes to the german embassy like because they had all these connections uh yeah, as we're done with this section, before we get to the actual food, tell us a bit about where the actual people who are running this place, what they're doing now. We've mentioned that before, but some people might be listening to just this part alone. So tell us a bit about that. I'm also interested. What happened with all their wine connections? Like They just dry up and go away. So just, just to add on to the last point, they, the place also had a few beers. Some were on draft. Others were by the bottle. It was Austrian, German, and Czech stuff. So, for example, there was um, Weihen Stefaner, which was the oldest oldest beer in the world still running. That's the one that's founded 10,040. Uh, sorry, 1,040. So I'm thinking in, like, 2040, they're going to have their 1,000th anniversary. There's um, Rotterburger. That's that's, that was actually Bismarck's favorite beer. They even called it the Consulate Brau, the Chancellor's Brew, because he liked it. There was Crucevice. That was a Czech one. There was uh, Curl. So they were big on the Austrio-German beer, too. Uh, but the thing with that, there were maybe like five or six, whereas the wine list was a bit more extensive. And they did have some hard drinks, too. There were some cocktails there as well. Um, not like you could get cocktails. I mean, pretty much every restaurant serves cocktails. It's like certain places I would not go to get a cocktail, but it's there if you want it. Uh, but to answer your question, I'm not sure exactly what happened with the connections, because the thing is, the way this started was that they... Wolfgang and Eddie were actually personal chefs to Austrian ambassadors, and then they ended up running the German house somehow through that. And then I guess somehow they met these investors through the German house, through connections there, and then they got them to to first open Seasonal, then Eddie and the Wolf. Then um, there was a place, Freud, that closed, unfortunately. There was also the Third Man, which is a bar that was near Eddie and the Wolf. And then Schilling, that's the one still open. Um, 
I, I know some of the investors like for these restaurants were the same. Like there was an Italian woman. Um, she was the main investor. I think she's still involved with Schilling. I'm not 100 percent sure. Uh, like I said, Wolfgang and Eddie don't work together anymore. I know Wolfgang got bought out. I guess they just went separate ways. So I'm not sure exactly. I'm not even sure what Wolfgang is doing. I saw something about him opening a restaurant in Long Island, but that was like a few years ago. So I'm not really I'm not really sure what he's doing at the moment. Yeah. And then Eddie, yeah. as far as I know, is still running Schilling. Um, I think he's still running the German embassy, too. But I don't. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. I haven't been in touch with them directly. So, OK. Yeah. If we do any follow ups, so depending on when you listen to this, maybe I think Schilling is something we talked about a couple of burgers. I might have been just one, but um, it was when we were talking about the burger series, there was a burger from Schilling that was in there. So if we get to the point, maybe he'll go to Schilling and then we'll reference this. But this kind of have a thing. That's another thing that we try to do is like if we talk about something, bring something up, it's only connected to something else we're doing because we just talk about a lot of things and just see the connections and the networks and things. Um, okay, so uh, now we're going to get to the actual talking of the food itself. Our beautiful faces are going to go off the screen shortly, and then the actual food will be on the screen. Some of these pictures, as Stephen mentioned, it was from some time back before we had thought we were going to be doing a series like this. So the quality of the pictures is not as good as it has been on some yeah. of the other series and definitely will be coming forward to the other videos. Like he's taken some really excellent videos. I've seen some of the posts he has on his Instagram. You can also find that uh, somewhere around here. Or you can just tell him, tell him your Instagram so if people want to follow you there as well. Yeah. What's, what's, what's uh, that? Oh, what is my uh, title? Oh, it's it's very uh, it's very basic and boring. It's just Stephen Kirshner, my name. Um, I think it's up on the screen, and then just eighty eight, okay. my birth year at the end. Yeah, it's not we'll it's we'll... it's not a Nazi reference, despite what some allege. It's my birth year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we'll put that on the screen. We'll put the yeah, it'll be it'll be somewhere up there, and somewhere down here as well, where you can get it on the blog or whatnot. You'll be able to find this stuff there. So if you want to see some of the stuff that might and, and might eventually get it on this series, or some of the things, sometimes you just post things that are not really necessary yet on this series. So we'll see with that. But some of the things we like talking about is the challenge level to make some of these dishes. We also think, okay, is there any cookbook or is there any classes? And this is a place that's closed and there wasn't a cookbook for this, so there isn't there. But at the same point, since Stephen was actually in the kitchen here, he's given us more like a cookbook detail on some of these things, knowing the intricacies of it. And it is a Michelin star restaurant. And one of the things I've seen that's a difference in the Michelin star is the plating is very important. Like they use yeah. certain plates, put things in a certain way, choose certain things. So with some of these ingredients, you might be able to find the ingredients, but there is going to be a higher challenge level to match the look of these dishes because of the way they're put together. They 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 have the effort to say okay now we'll be able we're not cutting too many corners we'll go and put some extra effort into something, in order to have this this one small piece of the meal, yet at the same point like they also find a way to, like if we're going to make like a foam for example we're going to make sure we have foam on several dishes so we're not learning this scale and only using it on one thing so in one dish it might be like five percent of the dish but then that five percent will be something that they can think we can use in at least four or five other dishes or it's something that we can use around the season even if we're changing the actual contents of it so that raises the level of i think difficulty in making some of the dishes that we've seen here but at the same point, it's it's still stuff that can inspire you. And I think that can, if you have had practice in the kitchen, it's the kind of stuff that can challenge you to like, oh yeah, I can see what they were trying to do with that and 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 get something in there. Anything else you want to say about the actual well, food and things? I've also said too, like, you know, and Thomas Keller even says this in his own cookbook, like, don't feel you have to make the whole dish. Like if if you if you think like, oh, this pork belly looks good, but you don't feel like preparing the other stuff, I mean you know, make 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 the pork belly and serve like a jam with it or something or make like, you know, you could do the schnitzel isn't too hard to make or like you could serve the potato salad at like a barbecue with ribs or something or like, you know, you can find ways to sort of like pick and choose. Then if you get more ambitious, you can do the more composed platings. And if you break it down component by by component, I don't think um, I don't think uh, it's actually super hard. Um, it's just it's a matter of like making each component then being able to put, uh, plate them and make them and plate them in a timely manner that that's the real challenge because it's like if you make each component one on one isn't that hard but it's like to be able to make all of those in a certain amount of time and be able to plate them in a certain amount of time under pressure that's that's where the real challenge is you know good point actually yeah yeah some of these things if you have the entire afternoon you can do it but then if it's like hey the orders come in you got to get that out in 30 minutes while there's all these other things going on yeah, <laughs> so yeah that that could that does change the situation. That's also why I'm like, hey, I'm going to go and make this because if these people can make this in 30 minutes, it would take me like two days to get all the things together, put it together. Yeah. I'm going to order it here instead of the chicken tendies, which I can make yeah. it all. Yeah. Okay. So uh, without further ado, if you're ready, you can get into the foods. Yep. Let's jump right in. Yep. Okay. So <laughs> as you mentioned, this is a restaurant, an Austrian restaurant. And 
I just try to do my best at saying the names, and sometimes I butcher the names, and sometimes I do pretty good at them. But <laughs> we'll just we'll get going now with the first one. As you mentioned, we started off with the desserts last time, mm-hmm. and now we're going to be just desserts through, and we should be able to get through with this one today. You still have to aim for that hour and a half, but if it's even over that, we'll just push through so we can get the last desserts out. We don't normally have as much to say off of the desserts. I don't know if it's this because they're simpler in general, or if it's because we've talked about the restaurant so much by the time we get to the desserts. Maybe we'll try to see what if we can do like the desserts first, or we might just do like a just desserts one, just like we've had the just burgers. Um, my, but- my, co- my comment on that would be because ba- uh, baking and pastry is not my career background, and baking okay. and is d- definitely different from cooking. But because I've prepared a lot of the... I've either prepared some of the entrees or I've helped prepare them or helped plate them. I'm more familiar with the intricacies, whereas a lot of these other... Um, these other um, desserts and things like I have an idea, but like I haven't physically made a lot of them. So it's like I can only like some of it. It's like I'm not going to say I'm not going to say guessing, but it's like certain things I have to kind of infer based on how it's made. Whereas like these other dishes, I can actually walk you through step by step. So I think that could be part of it for me, too. Yeah. Uh, and with these ones, um, there's also the the four things to look for in desserts. that Stephen has explained that these are the things that people at restaurants normally look to actually involve, and it's it's four C's. It's chocolate, coffee, um, caramel, mm-hmm. and citrus. Yep, yep, you got okay. it. Okay, so those are the four things that we normally try to try to find yep. and see. Okay, in these dishes, try to pick them. So when we're saying the when I'm saying the dish, see if you can pick them out before Stephen points them out, because I normally ask him if I don't like see something, but it's something that I kind of do. And now, now that Stephen mentioned it, I think like a couple of series ago, now it's something I always look for in desserts. Yeah. One of the four C's. So the first one here is um, apple strudel, which is this Op, apple strudel. Up, apple strudel. Apple strudel. Yep. Apple, apple, yep. apple strudel. Yeah. Okay. So this is actually an a, um, an Austrian dessert. Like this is uh, this is actually a Viennese dessert. Um, they say the their oldest recipe goes back to 1697, and it actually it's in a. Um, a handwritten cookbook in the Vienna Town Hall Library. So they're not a, they're actually not 100% sure where it came from because they're wondering if it was actually influenced by the Turks because you think of like the Turks that with they they make baklava like the Greeks do yeah. so they're wondering like this whole puff pastry arrangement um if like it was sort of inspired by that. Of course with you think about it um baklava it's typically it's honey, the puff pastry, um, you know, some, there's usually nuts in it and other things. Whereas with this, there's apples, um, usually raisins inside. Some people have done nuts too, but I don't think it's as common. But this is also rolled up. In um, in a middle high German dialect, it actually means, the name uh, strudel actually means whirlpool. And the idea is because if you look at it from the side, it's like a spiral of, um, it's a spiral of uh, puff pastry and apple. Because like you roll it up basically, and then you bake it in these long sheets. Um, the way you used to have to do it is you have to actually, like, well, I used to do it is you have to sort of like press it together so it holds its shape. And then um, it bakes and then you cool it. And then what it is, is that once it cools, the butter and the puff pastry sort of congeals. So you can cut it in these very neat pieces. And then you, you put it back in the oven then you have like a nice even piece because it's puff pastry so once you cut into it it's just going to fall apart but because there's so much butter once it congeals it'll hold its solid uh shape and then you can cut it okay yeah so okay um what's but what's what's to see here the 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 caramel is some kind of caramelized mess with the sugar on top maybe um well I i would say there's sugar inside um I, w- I don't know if I would really say it's caramelized though, because like it is a little bit like if you make apple pie, where like you have to like cook the apples on the stove and then put them in and then um, usually bake a crust. But with this, you actually like you lay it on the puff pastry and roll it up, and that's how you get that like spiral sort of um, shape. Um, so I guess I guess it, the sugar has sort of caramelized, but I mean that's a little bit of a stretch. Like I don't think of this as a caramel dessert. I mean that's the closest thing I could think of. Uh. Yeah. And with the strudels, I think now there's other things to put in the apple besides apples. Like it might have started with the apple, but then there's there's other yeah. things they put in. And is, is I, well, some of these, like Stephen will send me this document, and sometimes I'll edit the images beforehand. So when we actually record a thing, I can just do it in post. But I I, so I forget some of the dishes that are in there. So are there any other dishes in here with strudels? I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think there's a deconstructed apple strudel in this. Yeah. But um, would, would, did, did Seasonal have any other strudels besides the apple and i know apple to me seems to be the typical one from the area but did they release any other versions i mean selling other versions 
Not here. I mean, I've seen like peach strudel, blueberry strudel. I mean, you could take the basic idea and just sort of tweak the recipe like with pie or something. Um, you know, of course, obviously, you know, here as famous as toaster strudel, but it's like kind of based off that because it's like flaky. <laughs> it's flaky pastry. It's I mean, it's a different preparation, but it's sort of inspired by that. But then again, this is sort of, could be could have been inspired by baklava or something similar. So, um, you know, who knows? <laughs> Okay. This I'd also add this was on the lunch menu because some of these uh, desserts you'll notice have a little more casual of an appearance, uh, like the zaka torta, the last dessert we did. Um, the, the like the usually more casual ones were on the lunch menu because lunch was a little more casual. Um, you know, lower prices too. But then some of the intricate ones were on the dinner menu. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's uh, something we didn't talk about. Yeah. How many restaurants do that? Whole yeah. What is the reasoning normally with? Uh, the people who work at restaurants to change between uh, lunch restaurant, I mean, lunch menus and um, dinner menus. Why do people normally think about that? Well, it all it usually has to do lunch. Generally, there's a smaller crew on this, and usually the prices are lower. The idea is. Um, Usually because a lot of people are working or busy during the day, it's like people aren't going to go out and spend as much money during the day. So it's usually cheaper stuff. You usually have a smaller crew on. So the menu has to be a little more simplified. Uh, like, for example, Les Bollier, where I did my externship, they had like a lobster uh, BLT on the lunch menu, which was good. But like if you go went in for dinner, there'd be stuff like similar to this. So it's more like, OK, these are the business people who have a few minutes to get away, can spend a little bit of money, but they're not going to spend like two hundred dollars or something in one shot. Whereas dinner, it's more at the end of the day. You you're relaxing or maybe you're celebrating something or you're out with family and friends and you're willing to splurge a little bit and just sit down for a while so that's why a lot of places don't have super intricate lunches now i know i we had talked about the high-end um schnitzel at joachim wiesler's place like someone like him he may have a more intricate lunch but that's a three michelin star restaurant so it's like of course <laughs> you kind of expect that but in general i mean like bar Balloon, for example you had like lunch you had like croque monsieur you had this like ham sandwich you had like salmon club you had um like a, a small or steak things like that but then dinner because you had a full crew on you had like full plated entrees and more intricate stuff yeah are there any restaurants that you know of that just decided we're going to do lunch only or we're going to do dinner only what would the calculation to go on is this the cost benefit analysis not necessarily work to do that yeah, so some restaurants will do dinner only. Like, I mean, one example that came to my mind, it's it's closed now, but there was a place in the town I went to school in um, where they only, they did lunch initially, but then they closed in it for lunch and just did dinner. And the reason for that was they said lunch just wasn't busy enough. Like, it's one of those things where you pay staff to come in and basically stand around and then, like, you know, nobody's like nobody shows up and then it's like you're just spending money on labor. But then with the kitchen, it's a little different because they come in early to prepare so they can prep and cook the dishes at the same time. But but if, if there's nobody in the dining room, it's like you're not going to pay a front of the house staff. And then it's like you're not going to stay open for the sake of one or two people. And I know um, what happened with seasonal towards the end, if I recall, as it was slowing down, is they started closing Sundays and Mondays altogether. So like yeah. basically your days off were always Sunday, Monday. <clears throat> Because the reasoning for that was that um, Sundays and Mondays in the summer, sorry, Sundays and Mondays in the summer, because the summer gets so slow in the city that like, you know, you're, you're standing around and like 10, 20 people walk in and it's like, you're spending more money. You're, well, the thing is you're spending more money running the AC, running the lights, paying staff to stand around. And it's like, it, it makes more sense just to close and make money when it's open. You know? Yeah. You got more staff than actual people come into the restaurants. So that, yeah. Yeah. That would be kind of a thing. I can imagine that. Yeah. All right. Okay, yeah. So that was the apple strudel. With yeah. the, uh, what was that? Is that the the creme fraiche on the side? No, no, that, no, no. That's uh, that's whipped cream or German. It's called schlag. Um, I, sometimes they do um, vanilla ice cream. I think Eddie and the Wolf did it with vanilla ice cream. I think that's just the person's discretion. I mean, you could do either or. Uh, okay. Uh. Okay. So now we're going to transition to the next one. Yep. And here we have. Um. Okay. Uh, hmm. Palat. Okay. Palat. Uh, palat Shin Shinken. Palat Shinken. Palette, it's just Palat Shinken. Palat Shinken. Oh, I yeah. overthink this. I'm like trying uh -huh. to sort of like Schweitzer. It's like shu shu. So Palat yeah. Shinken, and yeah. that's uh, Hungarian crepes filled with apricot and rum jam. Sure. So the. This was actually, I got this a little wrong. This is actually the Austrian uh, German spelling, not the Hungarian one. Um, the Hungarian spelling is pretty close. I mean, again, there's a lot of crossover because, it, you know, Austria Hungary was one empire, and of course the countries are next to each other. Um, this is similar to the crepes. The, um, 
they, they say crepes actually go back to Greco-Roman times. Um, they're not 100% sure when. Um, I think there's some Greeks and Romans like talk about them or describe something similar. Uh, of course, the French are famous for this, but you know everyone else has like their own version of it. Um, this these were filled with apricot rum jam. So there was this uh, there's this rum. Uh, it's an Austrian rum. It's called Stro. It's uh, it's it's really nice. It's it's um. It has a very deep, uh, deep red color. It's very high in alcohol, though. I've seen ones that are 180 proof, which means about 90%. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a sp it's a, uh, it's a spiced rum. Um, and of course, you know, you could also say this is not like authentic Austrian because you figure rum is made in the Caribbean. Austria never even had any overseas colonies. This is just something that was made later. Um, but it's like it's very strong though. Um, there, there's also there's there's lighter versions too. Like there's like 160 proof. I think there's like 80 proof. Like you can go on down. Um, it's a spiced rum. Um, usually we would have apricot jam. You put just a little bit in because it was so strong. I think we got a, a lighter version too. Like I say, and um, just to sort of augment the flavor, this was this particular flavor this time of year. Um, sometimes it was blueberry. Sometimes it was raspberry. It just depended mm -hmm. on what the chef felt like doing. And um, the jams were actually made at the German house and they would send them to us. So it was like what they had available. And I mean, you know, a lot of people like crepes, so it's always like, you know, it's just, it's just a nice thing to have on the menu. Yeah. yeah and that's also on the side again, it's the same whipped cream from before. Yep. And with these, uh, that's something we'd mentioned when we're thinking with going forward, lots of restaurants will start doing more of this where you could probably buy certain things that they make in-house as just like a restaurant, but then there's regulations and laws and rules of packaging and the, the taxation and things like that to, that prevent certain places from doing this. But I, I, I think the world is going to go back to this more open type of thing where you can get them directly from the source. And I think a lot of restaurants are really doing this where you can maybe hot sauces and things like that, where you can order yeah. from their online store and things like that. And I think that's a better world when you do that. I think that's how you'll go back to having certain places have more like career people where it's not there's not so much turnaround because from your experience in the food service industry, there's a whole lot of turnaround, right? But there was yeah. a time when it was like someone would go there and work for life because maybe this is your sauce person. Then you can have people just like, yeah, I used to make sauces for these few restaurants. It's it's this the, there's things that the state the state of everything, <laughs> the state <laughs> governments and governance has mutated a lot of industries to a way that I think is not conducive to both the people working in the industry and the people being served by them because there's this middleman coming in that's not interested, that's not <laughs> held accountable for any negative results of the rules and regulations they establish on the people who are actually the customer and the provider of the service. And it's just, it's, I think they, they've mucked stuff up too much. I, maybe y'all out there listening, guys, gals, and everything else in between may disagree with that. And this could be some of our personal political bias coming into this, but it seems to come up every time I'm thinking about these things, I can always see something in there. And, uh, we're talking about desserts. I'm, I'm going on the side here. But yeah, uh -huh. okay, so uh, <laughs> any other stuff they had from Hungary? Like, so you say, the Austro-Hungarian, uh, yeah. These, I don't know why. I I guess the Eastern Europe is kind of an odd place. Right? This mm. doesn't seem like Europe, maybe because of also historically, when they had the war between the East and the West, that was in Europe. And it's this whole thing where some people seem to, they seem to be a like social, political thing thing of Europe just being this united place, this whole like Euro type of thing, but it's very different. Even the countries within the countries are even very different. Um, we've talked about this, we'll probably come more into Italian food, but I've lived in Italy and just seeing the different foods from different regions like Calabria, uh, the Roman area, like the, the Roma Calabria area, then you go to like Sicily's different food, you go to Piemonte area's different thing, the, the Florence is different kind of foods, like it's very different. So I can imagine there's also a lot of differences, but it just seems like East and West very recently, during the world wars was a, a, still a big a big division in there now east and west people think okay western europe and america and australia versus the east is in the orient but that's a very recent type of thing there's actually rather there's a lot of differences it just seems it seems to be less european when i start thinking of like the hungary or the, the, the not even poland less of a lithuania the soviet bloc countries they just seem a bit it's like a different kind of <clears throat> Place. I well, I, I was going to say that that's that's that complaint I always have when they're like they, they act like white people are all the same. And I'm like, you realize that like Hungary, Hungary is its own thing. It's not yeah. Slavic. It's not Germanic. It's its own language. Like they're not even 100 percent sure where it came from. And they actually <laughs> say it's a hard. They, but they, that's the thing. They say it's a hard language to learn because they think they migrated from like the Indian subcontinent or something. Magyar, I think is what they call it. Um, but then like. Polish sounds a lot like Russian, but it's it's the characters are more, it's more, I think it's the Germanic alphabet. But then if you look at like, but it sounds a lot like Russian, like my Polish roommate said he could recognize like very little in German, but Russian he could understand somewhat. But then, oh. um, 
Yeah, but then like Bulgarian and Bulgarians and Russians, they use the same alphabet. So it's like there's there's all this like, you know, the, all these different tribes, they went off their own way. And then I think I mentioned before, but Romanian is interesting because it's in Eastern Europe, but it's actually a romance language, which is unusual because most people think romance language is. Yeah, because they think most people think romance languages, they think Spanish, Italian, French, um, Romanche, uh, Portuguese. But the thing is, Romanian is, too now. But Romanian I remember someone broke it down. I saw some verbs conjugated. It's conjugated almost – the sentences are structured similarly to like French or something, like the way the verbs are conjugated. But the phonetics are way off. Like the phonetics sound more Eastern European. So it's like – it's all these weird different like crisscrosses. So it's like when people are like, oh, white people, they're all the same. I'm like, no, not really. <laughs> there's a lot – there's a lot of uh, – there are a lot of differences between these countries and they'll tell you that too. Like, you know, Austrians, certain Austrians don't like Germans. Germans will sometimes make fun of Austrians, you know, Hungary. I mean, it was one country, but it's like Austria and Hungary are pretty different themselves. So, you know, it's like, they, they, these are not, these are not the same. Uh. Yeah. I wonder how much of that language, you know, the fluidity in the language it lends them to being, to, to moving around, um, Europe as much as the Roman, the Romanian people do. Now it's, it has something to do with the politics and the economics of the country where yeah. they seem to move a lot. And there's actually that that N word that's used in in the yeah. in the United States of America for for African and for um for Americans of African descent. That's actually used in Italy and other places for the Roma people. Like they actually call them that. And something that yeah, yeah it's, it's 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 an interesting yeah. thing when you got there. And I was hearing people being called. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> What's going yeah. on here? That's that's an interesting kind of thing to see. But yeah. But the, but then I don't know if you know, but Austria's name in German it's actually Österreich, which means uh, Eastern Kingdom or Eastern Empire. And it was originally the the Ostmark and the Holy Roman Empire. And the reason it was called that it was that it was the easternmost German province. And you think about it, like you go to the east, you have like. Poland, Hungary, um, you know, the Czech Republic, Slovakia are right nearby. So it's like there are no there are no German countries east of Austria. So that's where the name comes from. So it's yeah, Eastern Kingdom, Eastern Empire. Um and then they, I guess I don't I don't know what it went. It was all smart was the region and then it became Österreich at some point, but I don't know I don't know when it officially became that, like what the story uh. That is one of the things that contemporarily people make fun of some people who are like, oh, we were, we were, we were kings back in the time, or we was kings type of thing, which is <laughs> right to make fun of that. But then you notice there's a lot of this Reich and uh, type of things, these, these glorifying type of things in, in a lot of European language. And um, I think that, that's something that is, it's actually come up in this one. I think it's, it's even here with, with the next dish, if, you, if we can transition into it. I sure. think the next dish also has that in there, which it says uh, Kaiser Kaiser Schmarn. Kaiser yep. Schmarn. Okay, so yeah, see that's also like the the Kaiser's in there. It's it's king. What what does that mean? So sure. Oh, by the way, I just sent you uh, how to spell Austria in German in the chat okay. if you you're curious. Um, so this is interesting. So Kaiser, I'd mentioned previously, Kaiser actually comes from the word Caesar. That's what they called emperor. Now this I'd I'd actually mentioned this dish in a previous discussion because the thing is, Schmarn. It's interesting. Schmarn is one of those words that doesn't have an easy translation. Like it either means like stuff mishmash uh nonsense like <laughs> random like it doesn't have an exact translation and there's different stories about how the austrian emperor like there's a few different stories i think the most common one which you know i probably like is the austrian emperor i guess was being served dinner with his wife and she said she wanted a lighter dessert because she was trying to watch her waistline and so he said uh, let's see what kind of schmarn the chef is serving today and i guess like the chef came up with this on the fly and apparently like the story was that the emperor liked it so much he ate it as well as his wife's portion so um <laughs> basically so basically what this is is um it's a caramelized pancake but what's interesting is the way you make it is you actually separate the egg whites you whip them up not quite a meringue um if you ever whip up egg whites there's soft peaks and then there's stiff peaks so soft peaks where they start to hold their shape stiff peaks where they're solid you whip mm -hmm. them up into uh soft peaks and you actually fold the egg whites back into the batter and then um and then what you do is you make the pancakes um in a saute pan basically some butter and stuff and then you you make them they sort of rise and you flip them over you put them aside and then to finish them what you do is you actually make uh, caramel, what you do is you take water, uh, a little bit of sugar, you let it brown, you um, put in some of the stro rum that I just mentioned, uh, you, you toss broken up pieces of pancakes in that, you sort of flambe it lightly. Um, and then you uh, put, the, put it in a plate with powdered sugar. Oh, they're also... Um, there are also rum raisins in the uh, Kaiser Schmarrn itself, basically raisins soaked in that stro as well as uh, sugar. And um, you just sort of sprinkle those on top of the dough as it's uh, making. I forgot to mention that. And then this one was served with apricot compote. Um, again, one of those things subject to change. Like at one point it was blueberry, at one point it was apples, you know, whatever they have available, what's in season, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. 
Now, yeah, so this one again, where we now we've well, not again, but we have the caramelized nest, and this one we missed it on the yeah. on the previous one, the yeah. palash palashinkin. Palashinkin. Uh. I already forgot. <laughs> it's probably never going to say that word again. <laughs> but um, that one, I guess, I'm I'm going to count the sprinkled sugar on top as some kind of caramelization. I don't mm -hmm. know. <laughs> That's enough. Well, I, I I should have probably said this earlier, but the four C's when they say that. The C doesn't have to be in each dessert, but what they're saying is you should at least have a menu item on your dessert menu that features at okay. least one of each, if not. Because the thing is, there are some desserts here that are like mostly fruit. There are some desserts here that like, you know, some of these items may not go well with. But it's like as long as you have at least one dessert that features each thing, like that's I'm not going to say it's guaranteed, but it's near guaranteed to pretty much be crowd pleasers because it's like mm -hmm. odds are you'll find someone who likes at least one of those. Yeah. Like things like apricot are they're they're apricot is citrusy. It's citrusy enough. It's 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 in, <laughs> in the general field of citrus. Yeah. So it's in there. But yeah, so this one, as you said, is mentioned. How, what other different ones have you had besides the, the besides apricot the compote? Uh apple, blueberry. Um I'm curious to see if anyone does this dish differently because we had it at Eddie and the Wolf and it was done basically the same way. Um I don't know if there are any like higher end interpretations of this. I mean, I guess I don't know if you really can because it's like it, I mean, the name it literally means like stuff or randomness or nonsense yeah. or mishmash. So it's like it's kind of hard to make high end, but I thought it was cool though just like the Austrian rum gives it a really nice flavor and like with the sugar um cuz alcohol is really strong, but you burn off a little bit of the alcohol and like you still get that rum flavor, but it's not like a aggressive like if you drink stro straight it's like gasoline like the stuff we had the 90 <laughs> yeah. the 90 percent like it's like it's like like that'll burn your throat all the way <laughs> yeah, ever clear ever clear is like yeah. well, ever clear was 90 percent yeah i think um, so yeah mm. you know, this one i'm thinking these are some of the ones where you can really play around with just the basic idea of it now you can do with like tropical foods you can switch out that alcohol with other more like local alcohols and things like yeah. that like you could do this like a papaya and then maybe some yeah. some uh, local kenyan gin instead of that and just do the same kind of thing so this one is definitely looks like something that we would rather straightforward to make it at home and you can play around with a lot of different things to get to get the the different taste. Now it, this one. Just, I, so, sorry, what just well, one thing that just occurred to me is you could even you could do like a more Caribbean theme, or you could do like pineapple compote, rum, and maybe some like sprinkled coconut on top or something. That'd be yeah. kind of good, I think. Yeah. Many good things you can do with this. Yeah. yeah so with, with this one, we normally talk about things like with the mouthfeel and things like that, and definitely check out the rest of the one. There's been a lot of different playing around and different kind of tastes and. Things will crumble in your mouth at different times, different kind of heats and temperatures. But when there's desserts in general, there's not too much you can do with desserts. It's more of the taste of it. So I think that's something that we don't really talk too much about. It doesn't seem to come up that much when we're talking about them. But it is something that normally comes from the series. And even so far, the plating has been rather straightforward. But dessert is dessert is what it is. <laughs> like it's more yeah. like towards the taste. There's, there's not too much visual-wise that will really stick out. I'm trying to think of the... The most visually appealing dessert we might have done might have been the one that like that Casamono one that had like the that one had some really cool desserts where like the the egg kind of thing it was rather simple. Yeah. Like the the yeah. white uh, it was a creme fraiche with the, with the the olive oil it was like a simple thing. But it's yeah, it was it was creme fraiche ice cream. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. and then they had the um, also that chocolate kind of. Um, like a, it wasn't, it wasn't like, it wasn't Gana salt ganache, it, ganache, ganache yeah. is a chocolate whip with cream and it was like mixed a certain, yeah, it's cool. It looked like a, it looked like a big solid glob of chocolate, yeah. but then it's like ganache. But yeah, that one had some more interesting uh, dessert platings than I've seen in most other places. But yeah, uh, yeah it's, I mean, it's, it's still dessert. The stuff seems like it would taste good, but yeah. So that was a Kaiser, Kaiser Schmarrn. Kaiser yep. Schmarrn. Schmarrn, yeah. where's the double R? Schmarn. schmarn. Uh, it's it's yeah, it's just it's just it's just schmarn. It's just yeah, you, know, you just pronounce it like that. Okay. Now on to the next one. Here we yeah. have the now there's all these umlauds and things <laughs> on there. Um okay, Caesar Caesar Caesar. Okay. Um hmm. Kasekuchen. Kasekuchen? Kasekuchen. 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 Okay. Kasekuchen. <laughs> Kasekuchen. And that's um uh, there, Bruno Brunois. Uh, Brunoise, fig, uh, fig ice cream, mascarpone, spume. Is it spume or spume? It's supposed to be spume. Sorry, that's supposed to be an E. I don't spume. know. It's supposed to be an A, not an E. I don't know why. A spuma. Say. Okay. And yeah. uh, cocoa powder and licorice mint. Interesting. Sure. So this is this was the German chef's Rene's idea. So it actually, it means literally cheesecake. So it's kind of like the idea of a of like a deconstructed cheesecake. So 
what he did was he uh, cut up pear pear brunoise. Brunoise is a tiny cube shape. He put those on the bottom. Fig ice cream that went on top of that. Then he actually shot this um, this spuma here out of a foam gun. So it's based on mascarpone. There was cream cheese. Um, I want to say. I'm trying to think what what else was in it. It was sweeter, so it's like you're kind of recreating like a cheesecake uh, type flavor, but like into a foam. You shot it out over top, and you sprinkle the cocoa powder on top and the licorice mint as well. So you scoop down, you get you you get the foam as well as the ice cream and oh, the okay. pear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really, really nice. Yeah, this was on. I'm trying to think if this was New Year's or I think this was New Year's. I'm trying to remember now. Yeah. No. What, what did he just come up with this by himself? It looks like a, what's is it more like, yeah. the whole, like constructing something or? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if he, I don't know if he learned this somewhere else he worked or just thought it'd be a cool idea. Or it, it was an interesting dessert because I thought it was fairly simple to prepare, but it's kind of creative and it's like it's one of those things like you can make. Um, you know, it's not too hard to make on your own. I mean, you could even like if if you really don't feel like it, you could even just buy ice cream and put it another ice cream in. But I mean, it's just like I, I'd have to look up the recipe, but I think it was like. Mascarpone, cream cheese. I'm trying to remember there was something sweeter, and then you put that into the foam gun. It has to be soft though, and then when you shoot it out, it forms it forms that foam. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and then here you have the cocoa powder as one of the seeds. It's on there. Yeah. No, because this is kind of like the thin mint type of thing, but not in like chocolate form. Like instead of using that whole thin mint flavor that you used to having the creamy chocolate with a with a kind of um, I what what yeah what is the mint what's the paste is it? What's the technical name of how you normally know, find mint when it's like thin mints? Is it like a paste or so? What's? Yeah, I don't know. I've never. It's never yeah. come up. So oh, I was also. I was also gonna. Process. Oh, sorry. I also realized there was also uh, lemon zest in the foam. So there's also citrus too. If oh. you want to look at it that way. So there's citrus and chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So now instead of having that that typical familiar thin mint type of thing or chocolate where you get like a piece of chocolate with a good mint in it, now you have the leaves with the powder. So that goes in there with the ice cream. So it was still soft, but the, the coldness was still there. So this seems yeah. to be rather interesting. And then of course you go yeah. and you scoop in and you get two different things in there. Yeah, so that's that's a relatively interesting thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um any other kind of combinations that would they would do with this? So this was the, the typical way they would do it. No, I mean, I don't. I don't think we had this dish that long. I think it was just like something for New Year's. Um, it was just like a creative, just like a creative take on like a cheesecake or something. Because uh, I think I had mentioned previously one of the issues before um, with the place was it was food cost, but it was also there were issues with plating. Like some of the plating took a little too long, and like guests would complain. So he was trying to find ways to sort of streamline certain things and. This was an example of something that was good about that because you you cut up the pears in advance and like you have the ice cream, and then it's like service. You just um, pear ice cream, shoot shoot out the foam over top, then just powder and mint, and it goes pretty quick. Yeah. Huh. And what was what? What did you say their their background? You said their background was working, but they had def, they had worked in restaurants before they worked for the Austrian embassy for the German embassy, right? So they yeah, so they worked in restaurants. Um, Eddie's family actually owned a cafe in Vienna for some time. Um, they've been retired for a while now. I know they were actually personal chefs to ambassadors, and I guess before that they worked in restaurants. I don't know. I guess mostly in Europe. I'm not sure like where exactly. Um, but then they did. They took over the German house, and then they met those investors. And then so a lot of these dishes you see the the um, the chefs Frederick and Rene. So Frederick was the first one. He was from Sweden, and then Rene, who took over, was from Germany. So yeah, because like I can the, imagine. In, go ahead. The Zau, like the Zauer brought, and you saw that was Rene's dish, but that's like an ethnic German dish, so that was like his take on it. And then a mm -hmm. lot of like the cucumber and dill and egg, that's more Scandinavian influence, and that's you know you see that in Swedish cooking. Yeah, yeah, because I can imagine if you have that kind of thing where you have dinner parties, events like yeah. that, you could plan ahead of time and you can schedule things. Like people will normally eat on your schedule rather than like them coming in. It's yeah. more of a it's a different kind of environment. So I was thinking it might have been some um, some differences versus people who've just been in restaurants their whole lives working towards that and understanding the dynamics that go there. Yeah. It's interesting, yeah. And definitely check yeah. out that conversation we had with Stephen about the food service industry. He's talking about different parts that he's been in because he was also working at some, it's like a care home or something that you mentioned. Retirement home, that was my first job. Okay, yeah. Oh, and, and also I think I had mentioned previously, but also Frederick, um, he he has his own restaurant. It's um it's called Oscar. It's in Williamsburg. It has two Michelin stars. So mm -hmm. I highly recommend I highly recommend checking that out. I mean, if I recall, it's not a huge place, and it's one of those like I'm pretty sure you need a reservation because it's it's only a tasting menu and it's not huge. So it's one of those you have to kind of reserve in advance. But I've been meaning to check it out. It's just a matter of 
planning and also I, I'd like to go with somebody. Like I don't want to go on my own. Like I, I'd rather have like a tasting menu with like someone else and just on my own. It's I don't know. But um, but it looks they have some really cool stuff. And oh, and he has a cookbook too. I think I might have mentioned Oscar. There's an Oscar cookbook. And um, you know, if you check his Instagram page out, he features a lot of his stuff. Really, really inspiring, honestly. Uh, it seems like a nice gig to finally get to that point yeah. where it's just like yeah. People come and just pay you to cook whatever you want to cook that day, yeah. or within within a certain limits. But that's just what you do every day. It's just that, and people just come there. So it's not. There's probably a lot less complaints about what's being served because they're coming yeah. there to actually get whatever you give them. It's it seems like a nice place to be at. I don't know. It's cool too because the thing is like I saw Frederick on his way up where like I worked with him. He was the one who hired me, and then like I started seeing him in. Um, I started seeing him in different uh, things. I even saw, oh, I think he was even in a Tommy Hilfiger ad at one point, and I was like, hey, I know that guy. I thought that <laughs> I thought I thought that was kind of cool though, and just like I could say, yeah, I knew him when. I mean, we have we haven't spoken. Last time last time I saw him was actually at Corinne the knife store. Like I ran into him randomly there. That was a few years ago. So it's like you know, I mean, I mean, you know, we, we're on good terms. We just you know we've just gone in different directions. So I haven't yeah. been in touch. Yeah. We're moving on up now. You're here recording. <laughs> Recording. Different folks, different straps. We'll we'll see you yeah. again somehow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so sure. while we're deconstructing the <laughs> the regrets of Stephen's history, <laughs> we'll go on to the next one of a deconstructed apple strudel. And this yep. is apple rosemary puree, phyllo dough crisps, apple walnut layer, caramel layer, and vanilla ice cream. Sure. So I wish I had taken a side shot of this as well, because the way it is, is that you put the puree down first and there's a layer of pastry. And then there was the um, apple walnut layer. It was like it's almost like made from carrot. Like I'm trying to remember there was like it was almost made from apple. And I'm trying to think there was something to thicken it. So it was kind of chewy. And then there was a caramel layer, which was just caramel that was worked into something a little more solid. And then you would put like puff. You'd put like puree down puff pastry. um, Caramel layer, another puff pastry, apple layer, another puff pastry, then the ice cream on top. So the idea is that you're sort of separating the flavors, but you scoop in and you eat them all together. Yeah. So with this puff pastry, was it baked as the sheets or was it like baked like yeah. a bread and then cut into the toast, like kind of slices? Yeah. Um what it was was you um you actually cut you cut it into because Philo, if you know correctly, it's um it's these like long sheets that are frozen. And what we did was we cut them into squares in advance and then baked them. And then when you bake them, um you make sure to turn make sure if you do this, you have if you use a convection oven, have the fan on low because once it if the fan's high, it'll they'll blow all over the place. But what you do oh, is you, you yeah. But you, what it is, is you put them on, you cut them into squares, put them on the tray, you bake them a bit, they puff up, and then you have all these like square shapes, and then you know you just you put those in a container. Then when it comes time to plate the dessert, you assemble them uh, one by one like that. And then the layers came from the German house. They, um, I'm not 100% sure what was in the apple layer. Like I say, I mean apples, walnuts. There was something to sort of thicken it. It's um. Maybe similar to apple pie if I had to draw a comparison, and, but like a little thicker, so it was more pliable. And then ca the caramel was just worked into a shape where it was you could cut it into pieces, but um, it was a little chewy. And then you just you had these um, you had these components and containers, then you just assembled uh, bit by bit. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what is normally the thought when people do? I've seen these deconstructed type of things in other places before. What's what's the thinking behind doing that? I think part of it is just to sort of like isolate the flavors to sort of like show them off a little more, but also just more creative presentations. Cause it's like, if you have the strudel, it's like, it's like, it's like apples, cinnamon, sugar, just all kind of rolled together and baked. Whereas with this, you can actually see each component um, just to sort of show off, like, here's what's in here. And then if you want to eat them separately, you can, if you want to scoop them together, you can, again, you can do different things with the presentation. It looks a little more intricate. Um, you know. Okay. Yeah. Now again, again, this is the thing with the apple strudel with the apple layer. Now you can switch out the different parts in there. Um, this again looks like something. I don't know if guys, girls, and everybody else listening, everything about uh, everybody else in between listening. Is there any other things that you've deconstructed or you've seen deconstructed? Let us know in the comments or somewhere. I think that would be kind of an interesting thing to see. Or hey, try to de deconstruct something on your own. But yeah, it looks it looks interesting. It looks like an interesting yeah. type of dish here. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, know, I don't have too much else to say. That it's the strudel again. I, I yeah. wonder that with like the people of the home country when they see things like this, like, oh, what have you done to the strudel? Look what they did! Mm. They massacred my boy. Uh, uh -huh. so the way things are done. Yeah, because I was going to say, I mean, the word strudel means um, whirlpool, and it's like the idea is that it's all rolled together. This obviously is not. So. <laughs> uh. <laughs> 
All right. So now moving on to the next one. Yep. We have um. No, I'm throwing around. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of it's a lot of I's and A's and E's here. Yeah. Uh, okay. So pistas pistatis tastis yen no. Pistas, pistas, uh, no, is that Stasi? No. <laughs> pistats, pistazzi, zien torte. 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 Zien, it's a Z I E N, is it's zien, so it's pistazzi, zien torte. Pistazzi, zien torte. Pistazzi, yeah. zien torte. Okay. Yeah. That's a pistachio cake, pistachio ice cream. Sicilian, uh, Sicilian, Sicilian pistachios, um, Siciliano, the Sicilian pistachios, chocolate sauce, and blood orange supremes, supremes, supremes. The yeah. that's the accent, the accent circumflex. The circumflex is like the upside down V. Yeah, supremes. They, okay. they, they agu would give it. They agu, which is like it starts from the bottom left and points up rightward. That would be like an A sound, but this is like an S sound in French. Supremes, okay. Yeah. Like flam, think thing. like flambe, flambe because it's e and oh, it's yeah, agu, yeah. yeah. And this is supremia. Yeah. All right. Um, this seems to be the same kind of rectangular type of things that we saw before with the with the foie gras and a few other things. And it's like it's it's a it's a style that they seem to be that seems to be common at at this place. Seems to be used at this place, but it's not just this place. I think it's a, when did this become more trendy? Have you seen a time when this kind of square, rectangular type of presentation of things became trendier? I'm imagining this wasn't a common thing back in the olden days when some of these things were invented. No, I mean, I mean, I think with this, like, it's a fairly basic, um, it's a pistachio cake. I don't know, you've, you've probably had something similar. I mean, I, I grew up on, I feel like eating stuff like this. Um, there's a layer, of, it's like a cream-based layer. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what, if it would be like, it's like a vanilla cream or something similar to that and then on top there's a layer of um there's blood orange uh, gelatin that's actually the, the reddish on top blood orange suprems you just scoop out the slices uh make sure there's no white little chocolate sauce you can see that's underneath um pistachios and the there's some ground pistachios to uphold the pistachio ice cream again all this came from the german house except for the blood oranges which we you know broke down ourselves that's pretty easy and um you know you just assemble it this was um this was a nice dish fairly simple but um you know it's nice if you like pistachios and a blood orange <laughs> blood orange is magnificent i remember getting to italy and finally finding it like Blood orange is essentially what pink lemonade is supposed to be like. And yeah. most people who think, like, there's a time, because I remember in the States I was drinking pink lemonade, and I don't like going to other places and getting, like, fake versions of it. I like getting actual things. So I was like, okay, maybe I can make pink lemonade myself. And I looked into it, and some of them, sometimes they use, like, I don't know if it's elderberries. They use something to add sometimes. But most pink lemonade is literally just lemonade with pink food coloring, mm. with, like, a red food coloring in it. And I felt kind of cheated when I had that. But then I found a Rancha Rosa, and oh my God, it's it's a magnificent drink when you just get the fresh Rancha Rosa drink. It's it is what pink lemonade is supposed to taste like. It's it's amazing. It's it's really it's really really great. Really magnificent. Did I ever tell you the joke in culinary school about the dyed fish and pink lemonade? That whole story. Yeah. Tell so us. okay, so so the thing is, a lot of salmon people don't realize salmon is orange because they eat beta carotene. They eat krill, which have beta carotene, so the flesh takes on an orange flavor, an orange color rather. So that's why salmon is orange in nature. But the thing is, a lot of the farm-raised salmon are fed an artificial um, feed, so they they're actually white. And the thing is, they'll actually dye the flesh orange to make him look like authentic. And it was funny because yeah, and it, it and it was it was funny. And that that's another reason people don't like farm-raised salmon because a lot of them are white and they're artificially colored, whereas natural Please. salmon they're actually yeah, I'm serious. But but hold on, it gets funnier. So what happens is one of my friends in school, um, he heard about this. He goes, oh, that's disgusting. And he's sitting there drinking pink lemonade or like blue raspberries. <laughs> and then and then the teacher goes, he's like, he's like, you know, there are no such thing as pink lemons or blue raspberries in nature. Right. He goes, you're complaining about dyed fish. He goes, that shit glows in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that is true. Like, why is it? It's like red number five is the most common, like red dye. And like, some of these yeah. dyes come from like really odd body parts of animals yeah. and stuff like that. Even the same thing with like perfumes. Perfumes yeah. and dyes are things that it's like people don't, you don't want to see how the sausage is made type of thing where you find out yeah. that information. And you're like, hmm. Yeah. yeah so you're, you're telling me that's like mongoose. It's like a spray thing is a mongoose butt. Like, he's making this kind <laughs> of thing that I'm spraying all over myself and like lusting after people. It's like, yeah, that's, that's, that's you. That's your life right now. Mongoose butt yourself. 
Okay, so with this salmon thing, why don't they just serve the salmon white? That's so stupid. These are the kind of things that humans, I don't understand why we do certain things like this. Like, why add that? Just eat, it still tastes like salmon, so just eat it. It could just be a marketing ploy, because there's a whole thing I think I mentioned before with, um, like ham, for example. Ham, a lot of people don't get ham's not naturally pink. Ham's only pink because of nitrates. But the thing is, they were trying to come up with alternatives to it, because the thing is, nitrates aren't the best thing for you. But the problem is, you don't use nitrates, the ham will turn gray, and people see gray ham and they freak out, even though like it's not actually bad for you, it just doesn't look uh -huh. as nice. But So they were trying to come up with alternatives where they can still make it look pink, but without the health uh, problems. Yeah. Huh. I'm, I'm unimpressed by, by, by people on this one. And, and maybe yeah. it's also me. Maybe if I went and I saw just like a white piece of fish. But have you had any of the white ones that don't have the, the food dye? No, I didn't even know until uh, he told me. But again, you know, I, I generally prefer meat to fish, so like, yeah. I've never really, I never really looked out for it either. You probably mm -hmm. don't get to market unless you actually go to the actual fish place. Because sometimes you were a, you were working, we didn't get this in the, food, in the food service industry thing. We might have touched a bit on it, but for some time you were actually involved in procuring yeah. fish, the actual fish mongers in New York City, yeah. right? So maybe they would probably be able to find some of this pre, pre dyed fish. But yeah, that's that's weird. Yeah. The dyed fish. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, with this one, this is the kind of thing where we were thinking, like with the, the plating of the of the foie gras looks like a dessert thing. And you've also mentioned that the foie gras yeah. has been on a dessert menu before. Uh, now with this one, was there any other different platings, different kind of mixes? Maybe they would switch like some almond, uh, almond ice cream and almond cake instead of pistachio ice cream, pistachio cake, depending on the season. Or was this like a thing where it was a typical thing? Um, I mean, the, the desserts sort of changed based on what the German house was doing and what they had available. I know towards the end, especially when Rene was there, he wanted to start doing more stuff in house and not rely on them as much. But it's tough because, like I said, we didn't have a huge space. So it's like you can't make all these components and like like it's so much prep to do for a few people, especially because Garde Manger and Pastry are the same station. Um, so I, I got where he was coming from. But there's also a point where it's kind of unrealistic. Like it's not you know, you're not in a three Michelin star place where they have like a full fledged pastry department and staff. So it's just. Yeah. Um, it's not as it's not as realistic. But for a while, the German house they would come up with different cakes, and then we would, um, you know, we would serve those and maybe make like like they would make the ice cream, they would make the cake, and then we would add like one or two things accordingly. Oh. And that was a pistazzi pistazzi dien torte dien dien pistazzi dien torte. Okay. And pistachios, yeah, the Sicilian, so this is not something that was native to there. But then back in the time of the trading times, nuts is something that was relatively easy to ship around. You didn't really have to worry about nuts going bad. So that's something that I think very early in trading times, there was there was a lot of movement with nuts and dried fruits and things like that. It wasn't yeah, I, tend, I, I look at this and I think like Sicily, I don't think Austria, but I don't know um, – but I mean, I mean, I know Austria ruled part of Italy, including Milan. So I mean, it wouldn't actually be that surprising if they traded with people in the south. I mean, you know, at some point, I'm sure these became more accessible. But this is this is certainly not a native Austrian dish. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Now the next one, I think, is more native, at least from the name. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, here we have the. Um, Bavarische, no, Bar Bavarische. Crema, Bavarische Crema. Bavarische Crema. Bavarische Crema. Yeah. And this is Bavarian cream, rice crispy candies, mm -hmm. strawberry, elderflower foam. Yay, elderflowers. Mm -hmm. uh, strawberry puree and buttermilk mint ice cream. That sounds sure. rather interesting. I don't know if you like mint and things, but that mix might be might be might be open to this kind of mint. Sure. So uh, Bavarian cream, it's kind of it's similar to the in, um, in French, it's called the creme anglaise or English cream. That's the basis for ice cream where you um, you separate egg yolks and, you know, there's a whole thing where you you pour the milk in, you add the vanilla bean and all that. And that's like it's either the basis for you can either serve it as like a um, a sauce or you can make ice cream out of it. This is a similar thing, but it's um, it's fortified with a little bit of gelatin, if I recall. And it's um, okay. it's it, it gets poured on top of a um, there's a slight cake, there's light uh, cake layer on the bottom, and then it just gets served as a cake. It um, you pour it over top, like you put the cake layer in the bottom of the thing with um, edges. You pour it over top, it congeals, it gets solid, and then you cut it out, cut out rectangle shapes. Um, so you know Bavarian cream, the rice crispy uh, candies are just like prepared with caramel and sort of dried out, just broken up, put on top. Uh, fresh strawberry elderflower um if you remember there was an elderflower gel earlier it was um 
Oh, it was elderflower liqueur. There was gelatin. I'm trying to think of something else in that. You'd actually put that in the foam gun and shoot it out. It would come out like a foam. Uh, strawberry puree, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. And then the um, the buttermilk mint ice cream, it kind of tasted like both. There was a little bit of that cultured flavor, but it also tasted like mint, sat on some more Rice Krispies. And I want to say this is tangerine mint on the top here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, that's some of the citrus. But even with the Rice Krispies, they seem to have some caramelization to them with the candy yep. the candiness of it. Yep. You could have some crunchiness there. Was the cream? Um, the cream was at room temperature. Um, it was cooler. I mean, by the time you got it, it was probably like a little warmer. But it's it, like it wasn't cold, but it wasn't hot either. It was like probably you know kind of cool, maybe lukewarm. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that buttermilk mint ice cream. That's something I'm really interested to see how those flavors would go together. Yeah. Hmm. It has a more cultured flavor to it. It's kind of interesting the way it works. Yeah. Yeah. So it seemed to kind of like smooth it out somewhat. The mint is normally like tangy or like tart, the tartness too. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I wonder how that would mm. be. Uh, what's that little thing on the side here? Is the this red a dollop of something on the yeah the the red no the, the, the kind of a white dollop at the oh that, that's the that's elderflower foam that's just okay. sort of like shot out onto the yeah strawberry. That's more for the flavoring and the taste, yeah. And how big was yeah. that tray and the thing that they do these square things in it? And it's like... Um, I'm trying to think now. Because there's some of these things I'm wondering, like, how much, how, how, like, something like this, how broken down is it ahead of time? So it's a situation where you're not, you're not letting too many things go to waste. Like, we don't get, like, 20 of these things ready and then you only have five people ordering. And kind of thing where you're supposed to play it usually box. came came in these plastic uh, boxes. I'm trying to think of the dimensions off the top of my head, but the way it is is that they would send us like one one or two at a time, depending how busy we were. And we had to coordinate with the German house, basically saying like, okay, we're very busy. Maybe get two or three of them. It's slow. Maybe get one. And then you anticipate you'll sell this many. And then if you end the night with like a few left, you you we would contact the German house and be like, okay, tomorrow we need this many. And then they would okay. make them for us. Yeah. Okay, so some of the things could carry over, so it's not yeah. too big of a cost So, Because as a general rule, most things in restaurants, you're not supposed to use past three days. So it's like if they get it and like you have a slow day, like you have one tray and it's a slow day. If you sell all those by the third day, it's fine. If not, they would say you throw them out and get fresh. Uh, unfortunately, there's some waste, but there's also after three days, there's issues with cross-contamination and things like that. And also um, time temperature abuse, as we say, because that was an issue at Bar Balloon, especially because there were a lot of cold soups, especially in the summer. And the thing is, but you have to make the soups outside in a hot kitchen. So going hot, cold, hot, cold, that's not good yeah. for it. And then the thing is, like, I remember the watermelon gazpacho would get, like, if, if you did that too much, it would get almost this, like, fermented flavor just because yeah. it was like yeah and you had, yeah you had to throw it out and make new because it's just going back and forth it's like it's not meant to handle that it's supposed to be you're supposed to make it it gets cold and then you serve it but it's like you also have to make a lot of it because you don't want to make it every day and you know you have to sort of weigh all these you know considerations okay yeah so that's uh two of these kind of rectangular boys coming in and then the next one i think was another one of these rectangular boys and this is probably going to be the cover for this part and here we have, I, I can recognize what, what's being said in here. I might not be able to say it's right, but <laughs> um, here we have the uh, Schokoladen, Schokoladen or Schokoladen, uh, has, Haselnuss Gianduja, Gianduja, yeah. Schokoladen Haselnuss Gian, Gian, Gianduja. Is that right? So it's... um. It's a uh, chocolate and hot sauce Jean Duya. So Jean Duya is actually an Italian name. So it's it's a German and then an Italian. Yeah. Chocolate and hot sauce. Hot sauce. Hot sauce. Because the Z is it's. Yep. Chocolate and hot sauce Jean Duya. So this is essentially yeah. the the axis. <laughs> yeah. Axis. The axis dessert. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what it is. The axis for dessert, and it's a chocolate hazelnut. Gian, Gianduja, that's the fan learned in Italy. There's no Y in the Italian language. So instead they use the G I sound to do the Y, the y sounds, so Gianluca, things like that. There's, no, there's also no J. There's no J and there's no Y in the yeah. Italian language, in Italian alphabet. And yeah, there's, like, yeah. there's no K either. Those are the three letters that are not in there. And um, they for the U C H, they use the G I for the J, the J, <laughs> the J sound. I know uh, Giannicolo, there's something else they use for, no, there's a, yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway, let's forget, is there a J? There are other things a J. 
Janikola Hilsa. Uh. Anyway, so that's chocolate hazelnut, uh, Gianduja, and then um, there's a J right there. But <laughs> <what>? <laughs> and then caramelized macadamia nuts, gold paper, tangerine lace, chocolate sauce, and fiondi latte ice cream. And what's it's fiondi latte? So, mm. so that that I, that I, I was looking up. There was actually uh, an error on that. I think they told me it's fiondi. I think it's actually fiore di latte because it actually means okay. flour of milk, and that's considered like the best milk. Like this, like the best mozzarella is made from this, and all that, and so on. Um, so just to sort of break down the dish a little bit here, so you can tell chocolate and hazelnut, that's obviously chocolate hazelnut. Um, Jean Duya is actually a uh, chocolate spread that, that contains about 30% hazelnut paste. It was actually invented um, in Turin in the north during Napoleon's reign. Um, so the idea, so it's sort of like a play on that. So it's like in German chocolate hazelnut, but then Jean Duya is also chocolate hazelnut. So it's just, I guess they just wanted to combine the words or whatever. Um, so then caramelized macadamia nuts. So you can see the macadamia nuts on top. They're just, Toss in a little bit of caramel for some character. Um, gold paper. Gold paper is more for decoration. doesn't really taste like anything. It's just to look fancy. Tangerine lace, same thing. Chocolate sauce. And then it's uh, Fiore di Latte ice cream. So it's ice cream made from the best cow's milks. Um, there wasn't a whole lot else in here. It was, it was sweeter. It's creamier. I mean, they added some sugar. Um, I think it's just to sort of indicate that it's a higher quality uh, caliber. I apologize. The canal here is not the nicest. I got pretty good at canaling, but the one here is a little sloppy in my opinion. Uh, yeah, a scoop a of bit, ice cream. Yeah. 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 So the gold leaf, I, I saw this, this one thing, somebody, it's like this, this, uh, this, I think it's a Twitter account. Well, like we're in posting the L's. It was like some woman who posted something. It was like, it's bill. It's like, this is a first date. Where like it was like seven hundred dollars in like some restaurant in New York where they have like a gold leaf covered um yeah gold leaf covered steak where the steak itself was up to like three hundred dollars yeah. just for the steak like what but then yeah. somebody else in the comments wrote that there was a, a Asian restaurant that wasn't doing that well and then they decided to start doing some like gold flakes in one of their simple dishes and then they thought oh it's not going to sell maybe it'll just be like a promotion type thing and then people just kept coming for it and then they wanted to take it off because they're like this is not really a good dish there's so many other things we'd rather do but then the demand for it like this is this is going to that austin powers thing i like gold like yeah. what is with the whole gold leaf on food like it doesn't taste in general it doesn't really taste like anything what you should get any taste is like a metallic taste is it actually gold when they do these like tell us a bit about the gold leaf yeah, so they say there's actual gold in it. I don't know how it's made exactly. I'd imagine it, it's sort of like the equivalent of like gold plated stuff where they don't want to use a lot of it, but they want it to still look like it. Um, it's very delicate. It's like paper. It's kind of sticky, though. It's, um, it's pricier. I mean, personally, I think it's kind of a gimmick. I mean, it looks cool, but as we say, it doesn't really taste like anything. It's more just to like make it look fancy. Like there was... Um, there's also a pizza you can get with gold flakes on it, and I'm like, I don't see the, I don't see the point in this because it's like I'd rather like... I'd rather like spend a bit of money and get a meal like I had the other day than get like spend a lot and get like a pizza just with gold on it because I don't know I I it's almost like people just want to show off they have money or something I'm, I'm not really sure the uh, appeal. <laughs> it seems like a very unnecessary floss because it's like it, it can't be cost mentioned. But then there's uh, what's this thing called? It's like loss leader type of things where they like like these people were saying they they got that in there and then people will come to that place like that place ordering the steak the meat itself is probably like. The, the amount they actually get the meat at most could be twenty dollars in the amount of ingredients to cook it in the time, but then they put the gold leaf and then all of a sudden it just knocks it up to like a couple of hundreds. It just it just doesn't make sense to me. I've never really found the appeal for that. But having said that, <laughs> it is a good plaything. That's why I'm using it for the cover, just because it's an interesting plaything with it. So what was their what do you think their thinking behind the gold leaf was? Have you seen it? Um, is he, have you seen it used anywhere else that you worked, or just the only place that you've seen it being used? I think last Polier, where I did my externship, they had it. Um, I don't know if you noticed the other day. We'll do it in the Gabriel Kreuther video, but one of the Petty Fours that I had the other day actually had a little bit on top as well. Again, yeah. same thing. It's more. It's it's more for appearance. Like it's like it doesn't taste like anything. It's just like oh look, this is a fancy item. Um, I don't know. I guess some people think it's cool or something. That's why they do it. I don't. I'm not particularly blown away. Again, it's like. I'd rather spend more money and get like really well developed food than spend a bit of money just to have gold on it. But I don't know, that's just me. So some places, I think, I think Danielle, Danielle may do it. I'm trying to think if I saw some of their desserts. I mean, other high end places I've seen it too, but I don't. It's not something I really like look out for. Oh, uh, Netta, Netta was actually on the. Um, it was on the Toro Tartar with caviar. They were on the most expensive omakase. You got a little bit of gold on your thing. Yeah. 
what's the supply chain for getting this gold leaf? It's an in-house or do you, they bring in, the, in sheets as like a company that does this? Like what, what's, <laughs> what is this? I mean, you can buy it off of uh, Amazon. You can buy it off of, even off of Walmart. Um, I'm trying to think if Restaurant Depot even serves it. But like I, I think this stuff's not – oh, uh, Corin, the knife store, they actually sell uh, the gold flex in um, – in the bottle that you sort of like pull out and put on things. Um, these were sheets that you broke apart. Um, the ones we use at Netta were like little flex that you just, you take out with tweezers and put on. Yeah. Okay. And does it, um, so it comes in sheets. So is it something like, like is it crumbly? Is it flexible? Is it like very thin, like uh, it, aluminum foil? Like, yeah, the- it's, it's like very thin foil that's kind of sticky. So you have to be careful not to like, like you break off a tiny bit and put it exactly where you want. Because if you like fidget around with it, it's going to stick to your hands and stuff and get like kind of messy. It's like sometimes brushes to kind of like tamp it down the way it like forms to the food. There's some kind of, just because of the nature of it, there's just that level of things that, yeah. that have the ability to stick together. So yeah, it's it just seems like an odd thing. I wonder what the history of it is. Maybe I might look that up. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so what else about this? Like, so, uh, what else can we talk about this year? I really like macadamia nuts. They're yep. you know, you're like on a ketogenic diet, which I've yep. done keto cycles before. Yep. And macadamia nuts become your friend on that. It's like yeah. <laughs> the main go-to thing. The the fats, the carb ratio is excellent on that. Uh, tangerine lace. So here you have the caramel. No, it's not. Yeah, it's caramel. There's chocolate. There's tangerine. And it's Fiore de, Fiore de Latte. That was an issue. That, I guess they told me the wrong name or I wrote down yeah. the wrong name. I don't remember now. Uh. I was trying to see. No, there's no coffee. So there's no there's no four. We've only done no. one dessert that I think had all four in them. But uh, yeah, yeah so we have that. But yeah, it looks, it looks good. I like the little streak down there at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, besides just pooping on, <laughs> on, on gold leaf for like a couple of minutes there. It's, it's still a, a really um, enticing plaything. looks good. Yeah. Um, Hmm. Yeah, any other different kind of mixes or things that do like switch out cashews or do something else with it? What, what, what do you think? Um, no, this was on the menu, if I recall, earlier when I started. It got taken off again. This was another one that um, it got um, – this was another one that, if I recall correctly, it um, it was on the menu when I started. And the German house made ice cream, the cake, and then like we had the gold. They Oh, they made the macadamias and like the other stuff we just played it in-house. Um it was only uh, I think we only had it earlier when I was there and then it just got taken off and replaced by other stuff. Eh. Okay. Now with edible uh oh yeah, again Spoose Eats again, which is a it seems to be a an accompaniment site that we have talked about a couple mm-hmm. of times in this in this series around here. What is edible gold leaf? I was trying to think of what's the background. I'm also trying to think, does that come under like the Food and Drug Administration of it? Or is it like some other industry to actually check and see if it's, if it's okay to actually get it? Who actually manages it? So it says here, edible gold, gold leaf is a gold product that can be used to decorate food. Gold is considered biologically inert, meaning it passes through the digestive tract without being absorbed. It is mostly used in desserts and candy making and is available as sheets or flakes it's one of the world's priciest foods, uh, but considering it's real gold, because considering it is real gold, the sheets and flakes are relatively inexpensive. It is important to buy uh, quality gold leaf as cheaper versions contain impurities. Yeah, that, that yeah, because I was wondering like who's what companies actually like <laughs> what companies actually going and mining gold to specifically give it to like the gold leaf type of uh, people mm-hmm. that are making it. So uh, there will be a link somewhere today. You can find that. I'm trying to see edible gold leaf. What does it taste like? It doesn't taste. Doesn't have a taste at all. The storage stuff is in here. Yeah. So there's some things in here because I'm trying to wonder. Like, I'm trying to find a history of when it started. I haven't seen it here. Maybe I'll look around if I find a different place with like, the history of it. Um, Ian's choice here is something, but I don't know. It's it's an odd thing. It's definitely something that's been more common, as you said. There's several restaurants you've been to in New York City. I've seen it just from that different blog post I was up, seeing a few different places. It seems to be a, a, a relatively trendy thing. Now, I think, if I'm not mistaken, there's one of those milkshake type of places where people go to take Instagrammable food where there's like a gold-covered milkshake. Or, <laughs> eh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I'm going to like, I, I also wonder the cost-wise. Can you just, let's say you just bought like an ingot of gold. And then you bought gold leaf sheets the same weight as an ingot. And then you like smush it together and just go home and like melt it down and make your own ingot. I don't know what happened with these things, but I know it's a different quality with the, with the gold and things like that. Well, well, gold, gold, I know they say is a very, it's a weird metal because it's very dense, but it's also very soft. So it's like, yeah. if they say it would be like the worst thing to use for armor because it would be heavy, but it would also be, be soft. So, yeah. yeah. But, um, 
but I, I don't know because I feel like with this because it's lighter, like there's a lot of air. Whereas like if you press it together, it'd be like a tiny thing. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I never really. Uh, yeah, but gold is is very very useful. Like people are like oh people just like money and they like because it's good. No, like I understand the appeal of looking at it and there's something that seems to be inherent in our human nature that likes shiny type of things like this. Yeah. The, the the luster of it, but there's many uses. All the electronics you use have tend to have advanced electronics tend to have some gold in them, some gold and some of these precious metals. Where well, there's lots of actual practical uses for gold outside of uh, being a luxury good uh, as it is, and that shows us the levels of exceptional luxury that many people in the first world have achieved to where like something that was such a rare thing that's used in electronics that was a luxury item now just being something that you literally just eat to poop out. <laughs> like you're literally just paying extra money to poop this out. <laughs> so it's like, okay, have at it. Sure. Um, okay. So moving on to the last one. Yep. Here we have a New Year's dessert. And this is a chocolate lava cake. Yep. Raspberry raspberry meringue crisps, raspberry sorbet and blueberry puree. Yep. All right, so for those who don't know, chocolate lava cake, um, it's, it's, there's an interesting story how the chef Jean-Georges von Gerichten, uh, he runs a restaurant, Jean-Georges, which is not too far from me, that's near the Trump Hotel. Um, he's actually from Alsace, the same place that Gabriel Kreuther is from in France, the part that borders Germany. Um, he, oh, he claims... Okay. Sorry, what's it? So the Alsace-Lorraine area. Yeah. Yeah. He um he claims to have invented this dessert, but then of course Jacques Therese <laughs> and others. Well, Jacques Therese and others have disputed this, saying that no, this existed in France for some time. Now, what what can be agreed upon is that Jean Georges helped popularize it here. Of course, a lot of places serve a chocolate chocolate lava cake of some variety. Um, so raspberry meringue crisps. There's meringue. You uh, I'm trying to remember if there's raspberry uh, puree or something mixed in, but then you put that in the dehydrator so it hardens. So if you have like if you you probably had meringue crisps before, they're little uh, pieces here. Um, blueberry puree. That's self-explanatory. Um, raspberry sorbet again, self-explanatory. And there's a little bit of sugar work on top. I I never really learned how to do this, but I guess there's something where. You, you melt sugar so it's pliable and you find a way to like work it. I'm trying to remember if it's with chopsticks or some other device where it actually forms this little nest type thing. I remember there were some in school I saw that were really beautiful, very intricate. Um, like I saw I saw this very beautiful caramel work where they were like, it looked almost like profiteroles or something, but pr coated with caramel. Then there was this big like nest of this thing, but caramel colored. And then there was like a big like caramel ball in the middle. It was really impressive. I think... Um, I don't think we've talked about him, but there was a chef at the CIA, Dieter Schorner, his name was. He passed away fairly recently, unfortunately. Um, he's actually the chef who brought creme brulee to America, and he oh. he was actually pastry chef to the Queen of England at one point. Uh, he's from Switzerland originally, and I think he would make stuff like that. Very talented guy. I mean, I never took – you know, I was never in his class because I didn't do pastry, but he was one of those people. Like, I would love to have learned more about this stuff from uh. – Yeah, I bring that up just like all aside. It's just um... – that would be someone really interesting to just sit down to and just talk to him. If you could just be completely open and drop yeah. things out just for like a week, just spend like a week with the Queen of England, Queen Victoria, and just like the life she's had, the things she's experienced from that position, from just being in her early 20s as part of the royal family. And I think this year coming up is uh, the something Jubilee where it's like 70 years or it's like 75 years of, of yeah. being a monarch. It's, it's insane, just the amount of things and knowledge she must have experienced and things she's been into and the different things that could have gone one way or the other from yeah it's it's pretty it's pretty it's pretty crazy like i'm not too much a fan of this whole royalty idea where you're just passing on the things but it's a part of our human history it's part of our shared human history um right now i think even the way the nature of the family is there's issues with that whole aspect of oh these are higher beings than us or they're more privileged but most of their life is not a life i would want to have most of their life is service to the people and I think even if you account for the amount of money that's spent for the royals versus the amount of money their activities generate for the United Kingdom, there's actually more generation from the, the, the grounds and purposes and the works that they do. People actually come to Europe, they come to England in general, to the UK, to see the royal <laughs> film attraction in that kind of sense. So there is an aspect, but that's something I think is changing, especially now you go like 
Prince Charles is definitely nowhere close to, I think, as esteemed as a, as a Queen Victoria. Maybe there was that whole idea that might skip to um, Prince William. And then, of course, his brother, aside things so we're getting into this, this from side, but his brother, uh, Harry, with, with his, uh, his wife, Meghan, like, they're now in the United States of America, and they're breaking off in different ways. So I don't know how much longer that whole thing will go up. But then, as you mentioned now, that they've had these people that have had these different chefs. And I've seen something else where there was, like, another chef that's still working there for Queen Elizabeth. And I really like watching some of these food things. There's some YouTube subs where it's just like the chefs, the foods that Queen Elizabeth makes. And I've seen a lot of these kind of caramelized type of nest type of things where you just, you melt it down and then it's like these stringy type of things. And it's it's almost kind of like a cotton candy type because cotton candy does the same thing well, breaks down the sugars into something that's more fluffy. But I think due to the temperature or the nature of the sucrose that's used, it gets to a more fluffy situation versus these thinner type of stringier type of things. But still, when you put them in your mouth, they go to like melt down and have a different yeah. kind of experience. And you have... Now the crispiness there, then you have the different kind of creams, you have the coldness. And the lava cake, if I'm not mistaken, is kind of just like, um, how do they make it? Do they make the cake first and then put the 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 chocolate uh, mousse or chocolate like sauce inside? Or is it like cooked already with the stuff inside? No, no, it's, it, they make it already. And there's there's a different stories about how it was made. And some say that it was an undercooked chocolate cake originally. But like, I guess somebody tried it and they liked the texture where it melts outward. So it's just like... You cook it to a certain level, so like it's it's runny in the middle, and it's just like it's a hot, warm center. Um, uh, you know, again, another one of those like accidental things. Again, Jean George says he invented it. Jacques Therese said he didn't. Said it's been around. I mean, you know, who knows? But I think I think it's just one of those ideas. Um, but yeah, it's, and then it's dusted with cocoa powder at the end. So when you get into it, you you bite into it. It's hot, and then it just you break it open. It just runs. Yeah, it's nice. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and the New Year's, you said the New Year's one with things where they don't be test out some certain things and then they would see if people like them, then sometimes they would carry them onto the regular menu, right? Yeah, it was generally a tasting menu for that occasion, but if there were certain things that went well, they would put that on the menu, or if it was left over, like, you know, you don't advertise it that way, but if, if there were components left over, like run it as a special or something and then just serve it for the next day or two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, this looks like it would take a lot of effort to be have this on, on, the, on the regular menu. Yeah, well, because the um, the German house made the sugar work, like I say, they made the lava cakes, sorbet. I think we got from them, and then like the meringue. I think I think I think they did the mer yeah. I think they did all the components actually. But it's like they would send you boxes of these components, and when it came time to plate, you would just you know you you'd heat up the lava cake and then uh, put it on, put it uh, um, shoot the blueberry puree out of a bottle, uh, do the little like globes here, put the crisps on, scoop the sorbet, sugar on top. Yep. Okay. Uh. Yeah. Well, I think we finally come to the end of our season. Yeah. Yep. Now, here we are back on the screen for all you out mm. there. And thank you, Stephen, again. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, guys, gals, and everything else in between that have been going along with us in this series, especially with season out and also just the series in general and a lot of other content that we've done. And yeah, this has been, this has been rather good. And <laughs> with this yeah. one, there's things that he's done. Stephen is still in a situation where he doesn't really have too much of a kitchen on here in Nairobi, Kenya, mm. but eventually we're hopefully getting to this point where this is something we'll keep doing along with other things that we're doing uh we're both alive we have no intention to stop doing these things but we want to yeah. add certain things like now actually attempting and making some of these dishes and also going into making our own kind of dishes and we'll we'll see about adding that into there and there's been many dishes that he's looked at and you know specifically it was one with the sweet reds type of things where these things were like okay we're going to try and do some parts maybe we'll do something or get in touch with other people who are more familiar we might know if we're talking about a certain restaurant, maybe eventually we'll be like, hey, we're talking about the restaurant you've been at. Do you want to come on and do a cameo? Or do you want to come on and do small parts or just talk about certain dishes that you have if it's a certain work inside the kitchen? Maybe Stephen, just from having his awareness with that industry. And also y'all listening, if you just share this content, if you like the content that we're doing, if there's more actual demand for the stuff, more people watching, other people who actually are in the industry might feel, feel more interested in participating and adding more content. But y'all out there also, if there's dishes or restaurants or locations in New York City that you think Stephen should check out, let us know and he might go check those out. If there's places you've checked out and you want to just send us little things about different places that you've been at, maybe we'll see about ways to get other people to just add other things, especially if it's dishes that we've talked about. If you've had an experience, you have some other things to say about that, let us know about that most definitely. Stephen, anything else you want to tell us about the desserts and seasonal and just the series in general? 
I don't think there's a whole lot else to say. I mean, we've pretty much gone through these dishes. I mean, I had a good time working here. I worked at Eddie and the Wolf after for about two years. I, like I say, I didn't, you know, didn't want to cook anymore. I used to come back and eat in both places even, even after I left. You know, always good experiences. Unfortunately, both are closed. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't. I don't talk to too many people from here. There are a few that I'm sort of peripherally in touch with, but people moved on. Like I actually worked with this one guy. He's from Taiwan originally, and he actually moved back there, and he has his own thing now, which is kind of cool. And then I ran into him on the subway near Netta one day. It was really funny. That was the last time I saw him. And then um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, Frederick. I've been meeting to check out his place. Renee actually moved back to Germany. He married an American woman, but I guess they moved there. Um, I'm trying to think. There were a few other like cooks and other people that I was sort of peripherally in touch with. Some of them don't use social media, so I don't have their info anymore. Uh, it, it was really, really good group, though. Really fun working. Uh, but you know, that's how it is. I mean, people move away, life goes on, so that's how it is. Um, you know, probably go into shilling again soon. It's been a little while for me. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. We'll see with this mandate. I think, yeah, I think they're only indoor dining, but we'll see. Okay. Um, I still have to check out Walls A too. That was our rival at the time. They're still around, so be curious to see how they are. Another high-end Austrian place. I mean, the only one in the city now at this rate. So yeah, yeah. that was one of the yeah. things. Very few Austrian places that are there. I don't know if yeah. anyone, yeah, anyone, let us know if you've been to Austrian foods, Austrian restaurants, and if you've seen some familiar kind of takes and dishes that we talked about here. And this, and this is the longest one that we've done yeah. of all the restaurants we've talked about. First one we did was Manetta Tavern. Then we did Huertas. Then we did um, Casamano. I might be forgetting something in there. Uh, we did a burger one. And what was, well, I'm forgetting one. Um, Mineta, Casamano, Huertas, the burger one. And was it seasonal? Seasonal was the next one? I feel like I'm forgetting something in there. But did, I mean, did I... I'm trying to, I'm trying to think Bistro, now because. Bistro. DB Bistro, that was yeah. it, yeah. So DB Bistro. So we've done those five restaurants, and we've done a burger special, and this is the sixth restaurant that we've done. And Stephen, as you mentioned, we're going to do Gabriel Kreuther. Kreuther. It's Gabriel, a, it's, it, Gabriel Kreuther. Right yeah, he's from, uh, he's from France, but he's from Alsace, so it's a Germanic pronunciation, yeah. Yeah, it's right in the border, alsace Lorraine, And then uh, oh. we're going to do Netta and um, Felida. Felida. Felidia. Lydia are going to be some of the ones coming up next, but Stephen is, yeah. is he's not starving himself. Yes, he's working on his diet, <laughs> but he's still going to be out there eating, and there's other places that he's also had history of. Some of the places that he, we've talked about, he's been back to. So mm -hmm. um and and we're going to keep we're going to keep this series going. We have no idea, no, no planning of ending this series. If you like this conversation that we've had here, which is more food focused, there's a lot of other content, a lot of other conversations that we have where we get more into like politics and certain things, talk about certain books, a couple of books we want to get into more into like detail, talking about the stuff. As we said, we're infoholics, we like that. And it's a really good series that I think both of us are very excited about with the I Know Great People series. And on whatever you listen to this, the first one is already out where Stephen talks more about the food industry. And we'll be posting more soon. We've done some recordings. And we might have a separate platform entirely for just the conversations. And then we're going to still have this Dying Alive section where it's going to be my content. Steven's going to be on here more with more our personal on the side things and break them apart. I don't know. We're, we're figuring these things out as we go. <laughs> as things are opening up, we're getting past this pestilence. The world is opening up in a different way. And there'll be some moves coming in. We enjoy having these. And we're really thankful to the input. And when people talk about Oh, we, we want we like what you talked about here. Stephen himself has had experience going to these restaurants where people he's actually gone to and talked to have been like, oh, we hear you talking about this, and it's helping him that one. So it's 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 a it's a group it's a group effort. If it's just the two of us talking, we normally talk about some of these things just by ourselves, but it's really good to have this ability to to be open and talk about this and share it with uh, y'all out there. But yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting more into the great people we know, great people I know series. And if, if any of you watching this have an interest, feel free to reach out. I mean, again, don't don't worry that what you're doing isn't interesting or anything. I mean, as Silas said, people watch the Kardashians doing nonsense for hours on end. So it's like, don't don't worry that your life's not exciting or something. I mean, there may be things that you you may be selling yourself short a little bit. There may be things in there that other people don't know that they would find interesting from conversation. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yeah, Stephanie, I think we'll, I'll, I'll try, I'll try to get at least something open soon, a location where you can send us, I think already Chefnet up at uh, carbon33.com might already be open, but I'll try to include somewhere below a link where y'all can send us foods and stuff that you've made, maybe we'll, 
we'll do like a thing where we just like user submitted one where occasionally we just uh, maybe have a show where we just talk about user submitted dishes or y'all can tell us about user submitted dishes that you have. Um, yeah. I, I've recorded a few things of me making certain things to post up. So we're trying to get to these different things, but I think all the projects that we're doing are things that we enjoy doing, but we're also doing this in part because we've seen other people do similar things, talk and share about their things, and we've found value from that. And we want to return that value to y'all out there and also get to a situation where most of these things we're doing, we're not, I, I think we're more comfortable with talking about certain things, going into in depth, <laughs> going to like the semantics yeah. in particular about the things than average people. But yeah. the things we're not talking about, we're talking about is not necessarily like high level, in depth type of things. Some of the things we might get into it, some of the things we might research, but I'm part of these platforms I want to get is to set up a situation where we can keep making our content it can be profitable. We are both capitalists in that kind of sense, <laughs> working way to maintain that, but also get to a situation where other people are also sharing content that we can also consume and we can also appropriate from and we can also share things and just spread this around. Because I think um, I think I think it's going to be a, a good kind of thing uh, with, with working yeah. on this and the other series that we have. But yeah. So we got anything else? No, I think that's good. Okay, so that's it for us, uh, guys, gals, and everybody everybody else in between. Thank you all very much. We'll be back again. Right now, we're posting every Monday. we got food stuff coming. We'll figure out the schedule for the other things, but definitely follow this space, follow this location where you listen to this, and we'll talk about if we spread it out to different sections. That's it for me. Goodbye. Bye, everybody.